This is the Art of Darkness podcast with Kevin Kautzman and Brad Kelly. We're a couple of very online writers interested in the dark side of what drives creative people to create against all odds. This show is about art and the people who make it, what it costs them, and what it takes to bring something unique and impactful into the world. Each episode, we excavate the life and work of an artist you might think you know. Don't worry, they're all safely dead. On every episode, we try and find out just what the hell was wrong with them and how they worked through their darkness to create something that lives on after them and continues to move culture. Find us online at artofdarkpod.com and on Twitter at artofdarkpod. All right, we've got some sponsors for the pod now. Wait, what? Every link you need for the things we talk about here is at artofdarkpod.com slash sponsors. First up, books. If you're into this podcast... Odds are you're probably a reader. We've got links to buy new books from bookshop.org and used books from alibris.com. And if you want to listen to your books, we recommend and use audible.com. It's great and the catalog is huge. All right. So if you're listening to this, you are online. Maybe you're very online. You probably have a website or are thinking of starting one. Maybe you want a website like artofdarkpod.com. We built that with WordPress, which is by far the most popular way to create websites. And the single best host for serious WordPress is WP Engine. I've personally used them for over a decade now, and I don't host my websites anywhere else. Go to artofdarkpod.com slash sponsors and click on the WP Engine link to learn more. Finally, the best way to support the show is at patreon.com slash artofdarkpod. Get the bonus After Dark content for every episode, access to the book club, and more. Thanks for supporting Art of Darkness. And I, I don't think that was too painful. I think no, we did a pretty good job good. there. Yeah. Yeah, that sounded good. Yeah. Yeah, we appreciate it. back with another episode of Art of Darkness, the podcast about the dark side of creativity. I'm Kevin Kautzman, joined by, actually first, I have to, just in in the theater of the mind, I want you to insert random belligerent motivational screaming in German here now. <laughs> I, 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 I always do, Kevin. I always of course, do. yeah, as soon as I open my mouth. <laughs> the great Brad Kelly the novelist Brad Kelly. Brad, how are you? V Gates Hoyta, my uh, hair. I'm great, man. How, how are you doing? I'm well. <laughs> I am going to use my mediocre German today on the pod. All right. I have been looking at the memoirs of our subject, Lenny Riefenstahl, and I'm just going to say, Control F Hitler. <laughs> That's a, a lot of hits, right? That's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of hits when you control F Hitler on Lenny Riefenstahl. Oh, I'm not even going to count. Oh, 344 results. 344 hmm. results, it appears. Um, yeah, so, how, how many pages is it? Uh, <laughs> the, the memoir? Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, this memoir is 700 ish, oh, okay. under, just under 700 pages, 650 okay. pages. Okay. Uh, it is one of the finest memoirs I've read. And I'll explain, Excellent. I think, the reason why. Why would someone who had a very deep working collaboration with the Austrian corporal want to write a very exhaustive memoir why do you think that might be Brad? Uh, I, yeah i think you're trying to uh redeem she's trying to redeem her reputation in the eyes of the public would be my guess i don't know much uh, about her but very good and and yeah. we're not going to get too far ahead of things but first a mm -hmm. little bit of housekeeping patreon we are doing well mm -hmm. we could do better patreon.com slash art of dark pod you sign up $5 gets you through the door. You get the bonus After Dark for every episode that we do. I'll tease the After Dark for Lenny here in a bit. I got some really good stuff for oh, the good. After Dark. Good. You get access to our Bookends Book Club. You can join us on Zoom and read these books that we have. You go to the website. The list is there, artofdarkpod.com. Up next is Aaron Gwynn. We're reading All God's Children. Aaron's going to join us. 
if you don't want to join us on Zoom, you're not available, you're busy, or you're just not into it, you can you'll we record those. So you can also listen back after the fact. You get lots of great extra stuff if you sign up for the Patreon. And I I have to say, the Patreon support literally keeps the lights on at this <laughs> point. <laughs> I think if we were this deep into this pod and mm. not seeing a new Some. patron. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Every day, every other day, sure. Somebody might fall off. Hey, that's all right. Two people replace them. If we weren't seeing that, given the amount of labor that we do for this podcast, this is an effort pod. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know that we would be continuing. That's not a threat. I'm not right. going to turn the car around. <laughs> right. But if you enjoy what we do, Please, please support us materially through Patreon. Brad and I have big dreams for the pod. We're doing our first Art of Darkness Live here in St. Paul, June 5th at Walden yeah, just Brewery. A few, just a few weeks from now. Yeah. It's coming up. We're going to do Fitzgerald Part 1. That's going to be, it's a free event. You just show up. You got to spend 10 bucks at Waldman Brewery. My theater company, Badmouth Theater Company, is going to do a theatrical presentation of the great Fitzgerald short story, Winter Dreams going to be a, a good time. We're going to record it. The tickets the, to RSVP, just go to badmouthtc.com. I just got to hammer it again. The Patreon really genuinely, if you're listening, if you're subbed, consider that five bucks a month. It, it's not going to go in terms of content. I, I don't know. Like legitimately, we, we're taking that money. We're using our precious time. We're mm-hmm. buying books and we're preparing core episodes like this one. You also want to get into the Telegram? Uh, do you like pens? Are you a pen respecter? Do you like to talk high-end pens? Because if you join the chat room at, I love that chat room. It sounds like something <laughs> from another century. If you join the telegram t.me slash art of dark pod and you post your pick, if you could afford any pen after you sub for Patreon, you, you know, mm-hmm. now you're going to start putting money away from your, for your ideal pen if you hit the chat with that, yeah. you're instantly recognized as an Art of Darkness OG. Right. <laughs> we don't just talk about high-end pens in the Telegram, but it seems mm-hmm. to be a, a topic of conversation it, it, that it, comes up. It is. There's a surprising number of people who are really into pens, which is cool. I Yeah, we're yeah. into it. Yeah. yeah, and then, of course, you got to follow us on Twitter, twitter.com slash art of dark, pro- dark pod. Tell us what we got wrong. Tell us what we got right. You can harass mm-hmm. Brad there. Brad mans that account. I man mm-hmm. the Patreon. Mm-hmm. And YouTube. Go and sub on YouTube if you want to see our faces. YouTube.com slash at art of dark pod. All right, that is housekeeping cool. out of the way. Let's start with the yeah. classic art of darkness question. And we can't forget the closer. But let's start with the... Yeah. Uh, and I don't know that I have the closer in my notes. Oh, no, I do. Okay, great. <laughs> What would Lenny or <laughs> that's the closer? <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> ah, time is a flat circle. What that's is time? Right. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I'm going to get it in. Well, okay. All right. Brad, what do you know about Lenny Riefenstahl? Uh, I don't know a whole lot. I know that a German uh, filmmaker um, made, uh, I believe, Triumph of the Will made a film about i think it's the 1936 olympics i've never seen either of those so i don't honestly know much about them uh other than i know they are um they're one of these things where they do get some amount of respect from a craft standpoint but there's always kind of this asterisk that it's got something to do with the nazi party i i don't know I don't know much about her. I don't know how much of a partisan she was. I, I, I couldn't tell you a single word about her politics uh, personally. Um, I know she lived for a long time after World War II and was not sort of, she must have been uh, denazified or repatriated in some way because I don't think she, you know, she didn't spend the rest of her life in, in, in prison or anything. So, um, yeah, I, I, I honestly, I don't know a whole lot about her. So I'm looking forward to learning a lot more. Very interesting, Brad, because I think that's kind of maybe the baseline knowledge mm-hmm. of the mm-hmm. average American, maybe above average. I think we're, just, we're above average, maybe above average American. <laughs> I'll, ask my, I'll ask my mechanic. Yeah, right. Right. Knows right. <laughs> Reef and yeah. what? Yeah. <laughs> Reef or madness? Uh, yeah, but that that's a pretty fair base, baseline. And so okay. I think you're going to be surprised. And we are going to 
the heights of paradise to the depths of hell mm. in this episode. It is staggering. It is one of the the most the most intense stories that I've encountered uh, covering the subjects for for Art of Darkness. Uh, I can't wait to get into it. Yeah, looking forward. So. To it. I'm going to tease the After Dark now. So After Dark for Patreon, patreon.com slash Art of Dark Pod. I'm going to tell three stories. And I think this After Dark might go a little long because there's quite a lot of interesting stuff here. One, I'm going to tell the story of how Lenny had her film career saved by a mountain witch. Ah, okay. Yeah. I'm going to do it. <laughs> okay, good. Right. Uh, I'm also going to talk about when... Lenny wrote a screenplay or tried to write a screen screenplay with L. Ron Hubbard. Really? LRH. LRH oh shows up in this episode. That's Can you a, wow. believe it? That's yeah. crazy. And I'm also going to talk about the time she shot Mick Jagger. Like his with, wife. A, with a gun? With a camera. Uh, okay, okay. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. The, the direction this was going, it was like it could be going anywhere. So, <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. No, the current Mick Jagger is a clone. He's the fifth Mick Jagger. Right. And she right. killed Jagger number two. Uh, no. Explains a lot. Right. Yeah. Right. That would explain a lot, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. We'll be dead. Keith Richards will, will still be rocking, rocking and rolling. Um, all right, and before we get into the bio, I just have to mention the source material. I'll use the Wikipedia and various online sources for the spine of the bio. I find that to be a very uh, sort of satisfactory way to do this. Wikipedia is not perfect, but at least at least it helps me construct the shape of a biography. Mm -hmm. uh, if I had typos in Wikipedia, really? do, be do better, Wikipedia editors. And, and there's also these like... Well, they can only do so much, right? But there's there's obviously strange little constructions where you go, well, that's not exactly what happened. He, you know, she didn't receive a package. He brought it to her in the hospital, if, if mm -hmm. her memoir is to be trusted, which mm -hmm. brings me to the memoir. Mm -hmm. Now, this this entire episode is going to have an asterisk. Uh retweets are not endorsements, yeah. right? We are not Philistines. We understand that Lenny is a, a bit of a third rail. There's, mm -hmm. this is a very intense topic. We do, we're going to laugh. We laugh so we don't cry, but we do take this stuff pretty seriously. We get it. Mm -hmm. We understand. Uh, yeah. There's a, there was a document documentary that was made, which we'll talk about that she participated in, obviously called the wonderful, horrible life of Lenny Riefenstahl. Oh, wow. And three hours long worth watching if you listen to this uh don't change that dial uh but if you listen to this and you're interested in her i would say the two pieces of media to consume would be that and then her memoir mm. uh yeah and and uh they cover it we get it yeah. she worked she worked f for hitler right right there's no what are what are we supposed to say about this perfect art of darkness subject yeah, I mean, to, to pretend these people don't exist doesn't do anybody. Uh, there's no benefit to that. No, right? And yeah. and you know, when when we were at Texas, where we met for for grad school, I I took a like an upper level undergraduate class from a great professor who, who grew up in the rubble uh, in mm. Germany, and it was his last class. He didn't tell us that it, that it was his last class teaching after like 40 years of teaching. Wow. And, and it was incredible. I mean, we all applauded for him. It was, it was a really, really wonderful class. Mm -hmm. One of those classes where you go, wow, this is incredible. Uh, and we studied German cinema. And you, you're you going to watch this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is one of the points that I'll make throughout the course of this episode. Both uh, Triumph of the Will and Olympia are touchstones of cinematic technique for propaganda and the way that politics is presented mm -hmm. they still refer to it and olympia absolutely transformed the way that sport is presented every time you tune in to a sporting event you're watching an echo of an echo of lenny riefenstahl's contributions wow. to cinema and to sport and the 36 olympics are that was the first time they had the 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 torch relay, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. But then they lit the flame. Mm -hmm. 
every time you watch that, Lenny was the first person to to put that on mm. camera. Okay. And and display it. There's a, and there's an awful lot of new nuance here. Uh sure. and we'll get into not all of it. The memoir is 650 pages, right. but we're going to get into a lot of it. <laughs> and I am going to lean heavily on the memoir. Context. This is a woman, a very, very famous woman, a household name, certainly in Europe, mm. certainly in Deutschland. And uh, she wrote this to rehabilitate her her image and to give like the comprehensive review of her of her life. So occasionally we're going to have like dueling memoirs, like Goebbels in his diary would say one thing. Lenny mm. would say another thing. I love the image of Goebbels diary. Like it's like a, like a pink diary with a little locket. He's, <laughs> right. he's, he's, he's writing just, in it. Oh, he's laying on his oh, stomach with his feet oh, kicking. You know? <laughs> oh, I hope, I hope uh, Adolf, I hope Adolf calls. I hope he calls tomorrow. <laughs> you know, um, uh. Goebbels was a bit of a prankster too. <laughs> really? Discovered. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That somehow fits in <laughs> maybe, a weird maybe, way. Right, right. There's. We'll get uh, if I don't touch on it in the memoir because I've got her her early life. I'm going to dwell on the memoir. But there was a screening of some film. Ah, it was um, all quiet on the Western Front, hmm. uh, which Lenny knew the um, the fellow who wrote that, whose name escapes me off the cuff. But hmm. when they screened it, uh, Goebbels released a bunch of mice at the premiere as a kind of protestation which is very funny you think of all these like right dressed up fancy you know like dressed up for almost for like the opera people germans and then suddenly there's mice everywhere mice. so yeah oh oh that Goebbels. uh he's just uh yeah so he's he'll he'll appear um interesting hmm. okay yeah yeah and then the other books that i that i'm principally gonna um rely on are so I have her memoir showing it for YouTube. Mm -hmm. I've got a book called Lenny, the life and work of Lenny Riefenstahl, Stephen Bach. Okay. And then I've got uh, Lenny Riefenstahl, a life by Jürgen Frimborn. Uh, but principally the memoir, because it's just so uh, well-written, frankly, it's like, you know, you pick up a book and you get a page, you get a page or two in, and you go, "Ugh." Yeah. I, I grabbed another Lenny book and I I looked at it and I was like, "Oh, that's not going to be that helpful. This isn't even especially well written, like on a paragraph yeah. level." level. Mm -hmm. Lenny's memoir, like mm -hmm. on the cover, I mm -hmm. I actually find this pull quote or this blurb a little clunky, but this is mm -hmm. from the New York Times book review, John Simon. An extraordinary life does not contain a single unspell binding page. I don't like unspell no. binding, but, <laughs> no. but it's true. It's like, mm. it reads like a novel and, uh, she cool. was a genius. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So this is a woman. I don't doubt if she had said, I'm just going to write novels. She probably could have done it. Right. She was an autodidact. And this is going to bring me to a point I want to make before, if I, before I get into the, the bio proper, what if I told you, and I, I wrote this down because I've been thinking about this. There was a woman born at the turn of the 20th century who had a breakout career as a dancer, starred in a series of popular films, like A-list celebrity, hmm. um, couldn't dance, suffered an injury, couldn't dance anymore, and went on to direct two seminal films which continue to influence filmmakers and even define the way political events and sports are, are filmed. You'd think she'd be like a top girl boss mentioned right. like regularly, like Madame right. Curie as an inspiration. There'd be a Google, there'd a, be a Google doodle of her on her birthday. A hundred percent. Yeah. 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 Uh, I'm just pulling up the, the Wikipedia here now. So I have it. Yeah. She was born. Yeah. At the turn of the century. And beyond all of that, you, you know, she's in it. You'd think she'd be propped up because those are, traditionally masculine domains mm -hmm. politics sports film mm -hmm. right and then later in life she would go on and do this extraordinary work photographing african tribes oh, and even okay pioneering underwater photography in fact she was probably and we'll cover all this 
she was probably the oldest or one of the oldest active scuba divers in the world for a period of time. Okay. Right? You know how we have Chad's and we have Stacy's? She's yeah. like a top Stacy. Right. Top <laughs> Stacy. Just a boss. She's yeah. like Chad's are on notice. Wow. She's more Chad than most Chad's. Wow. Total wow. alpha boss lady. Yeah. One problem. She was friends with Adolf Hitler. <laughs> I don't like this like, guy. I don't like this guy at all. What did Norm say? Hey, yeah. Oh, hold the yeah. fort. <laughs> yeah. Control yeah. F. Yeah. Yeah. And so there we go. And throughout throughout this, and I think we're just going to stop. We're not going to do any of these fumbling apologetics on her behalf no. or try to explain the association. <clears throat> we cover the dark side of dead artists. I didn't have to go looking for it here. Uh, she said... Like later in life, her one regret was meeting that man. Meeting that man. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and this is this is mm-hmm. we see this anytime we cover. A, 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 well, we haven't covered that many, but 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 I, I'm reminded of the Junger episode, the Ernst Ernst Junger episode. Yeah, j- just because you happen to be in the right in the same area, it, you do get a little bit of that guilt by association through the historical lens. But it's it's worth it's worth piercing through that to try and understand what was really going on 100 percent. these things are so easy to say you know 60 70 80 years later say well i would you shouldn't have sure. done that right and it's right. like these things that aren't as yeah. obvious when they're happening what's ha- what is actually happening 100 percent. i think americans of our generation who lived through i don't know say iraq right like yeah. it's we're relitigating the meaning of that now mm-hmm. and uh, you know, I'm not trying to compare the two, but right. and yet it's there. So let's let's come to this with a bit of generosity and try to understand her, where she was coming from, how she got cut up, caught up in it, and uh, what happened. All right, let's get into it. Mm-hmm. Helena Bertha Amelie Lenny Riefenstahl was born in Berlin on the 22nd of August, 1902. Her father, Alfred Theodore Paul Riefenstahl owned a successful heating and ventilation company and wanted his daughter to follow him into the business world. Firmly middle-class family. Mm-hmm. Bourgeois. Mm-hmm. Since Riefenstahl was the only child for several years, Alfred wanted her to carry on the family name and secure the family fortune. However, her mother, Bertha Ida Sherlach Riefenstahl, um, had been a part-time seamstress before her marriage had faith in Riefenstahl and believed that her daughter's future was in show business. And I'm going to give a little overview of the early life here, and then I'm going to get into the memoir. I got a ton of stuff from the early life because it's so fascinating. Uh, Riefenstahl had a younger brother, three years her junior, Heinz, who uh, who she described as quiet and withdrawn. Riefenstahl fell in love with the arts in her childhood. Total theater kid. Mm -hmm. She began to paint and write poetry at the age of four. She was also athletic and at the age of 12 joined a gymnastics and swimming club. Her mother was confident her daughter would grow up to be successful in the field of art and gave her her full support, unlike her father. And we're going to see how this played out. Like she would be taking dancing lessons secretly. Dad, we're right in that period where... And she says it in her her memoir, like to her father, getting on stage and performing for strangers was one step above the gutter prostitution. Wow. Okay. Okay. We're in that period. And of course it's not anymore. Is it? We're, you were, we're we're highly respected content creators, Brad. (laughs) Oh, we we are. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, That's that's good. I got that going for me at least. Yeah. So (laughs) And it's really important here to understand who we're dealing with. And she doesn't really point at it too directly in her uh, memoir, I'm sure out of modesty. I mean, as modest as anyone can be writing a 650-page memoir about themselves, Um, not autobiography. But she drove men insane. Yeah, well, I saw the the picture of her from the 1930s here, and yeah, she was a she was an attractive woman, and so you add this clearly brilliant and physically talented. I mean, she's a dynamo. She was she drove men insane. 
I can't believe it. Uh, and somebody, one of our uh, uh, friends from the pod on Twitter was sort of pointing out possible corollaries between her and Marilyn. And I mm-hmm. thought, about, thought about it a little bit. And Lenny's upbringing was not nearly as Dickensian as Marilyn's, but they did kind of come up you know roughly at the same time and we'll see lenny dealt with casting couch stuff too mm-hmm. in in berlin and there it is yeah. and we'll we'll get to it um okay so oh one final thing before i before i dive into her memoir she would describe like so many people hitler as hypnotic hmm. and he he obviously he had something going on that would compel people to listen and to follow and to uh become attached and all the rest she was projecting to a degree because she was whatever he had she had some kind of feminine equivalent of it Mm. without a doubt uh so i think when in her case it's a bit of game knows game right Uh, All right, so let's get into the memoir. There's so much to read and so much to do. How much time do you have, Brad? We're going to go long. It's going to be good. Let's do it. All right. I was warming up earlier. All right. Here she is talking about her childhood. As a young girl, I was happy growing up amid trees and bushes, plants and insects, a veritable child of nature, shielded and protected in an era undisturbed by radio and television. By the time I was four or five years old, however, I was beginning beginning to enjoy dressing up and playing games of fantasy. I clearly remember an evening in the apartment on Prinz Eugenstrasse in the wedding district of Berlin, where I was born. My parents were out. With the help of bedsheets, I transformed my brother Heinz, three years of my junior, into an Egyptian mummy, binding him so tightly that he could not move, while I turned myself into an Indian dancing girl by wrapping... Tula around my body and donning my mother's long lilac evening gloves. The moment I rather dreaded came when my parents returned and my astonished mother stood staring at this scene, especially at the mummified body of my baby brother. She confessed to me later, however, that she too had wanted to be an actress, but instead had married at the age of 22. Dear God, forgive me a beautiful daughter who will become a famous actress. Unfortunately, or so it seemed, the girl born to her on the 22nd of August, 1902, was ugliness itself, wizened, cross-eyed, and with thin, wispy hair. Having been told that my mother wept bitterly when she first saw me, I found small comfort in the assurances of cameramen later on that my slightly squinting gaze was perfect for the two-dimensional medium of film. My father, Alfred Riefenstahl, was a businessman, the owner of a large heating and ventilation firm who, where work was concerned, was modern and far-sighted. Before World War I, for example, he installed modern sanitation in many of Berlin's buildings. He met my mother, Bertha Sherlock, at a fancy dress party, and like her, oh, Art of Darkness Live is 100% a fancy dress party. The (laughs) fancier... Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I, <laughs> it's Fitzgerald. Yeah. So it's you, Fitzgerald, yeah. yeah. We should get tuxes. Okay, yeah. in any case. Um, and like her, he loved the theater. Yet, although they went off into plays, he considered the acting pre- profession to be not quite respectable. Hmm. Actresses especially were held in deep suspicion of being no better than they should be. The one exception to this was Fritzi Masary, a famous soubrette whom he adored and whose performances he never willingly missed. All those actresses, except Fritzi, she's the good one. (laughs) My father was a tall, powerful man with blonde hair and blue eyes, full of joie de vie, an impetuous nature, and very strong-willed. He could easily lose his temper if he did not get his own way, especially with my mother and me. But people, as a rule, did not dare to contradict him. He took charge everywhere, among his relatives or among his friends he hunted with, bowled with, played cards with. He had the final say about anything concerning his wife and children, no matter how strongly my mother argued her own point of view. As a young man, he had dabbled in acting and had a good voice, but he never dreamed that his daughter might develop similar inclinations. (laughs) Uh, This is a good point to go through here. The first play I ever saw as a child of four or five was an unforgettable experience. It was a Christmas. It was at Christmas and the play was Snow White, but I can't remember the name of the theater in Berlin. 
My excitement was at fever pitch on the train ride home, and I can still recall how the other passengers finally covered their ears and begged my mother to make her hysterical child stop babbling. I was fascinated by the very idea of the theater and of all that mysterious world behind the curtain. As I grew, so did my curiosity, and I would bombard with questions anyone I could find who had anything at all to do with the stage. In fact, I was generally inquisitive. At school, I was probably the only pupil who constantly earned bad marks for conduct because I so often interrupted the teacher with questions. And my poor father was struck for an answer when I insisted that he would tell me exactly how many stars there were in the sky. Mm. Yeah. So interesting stuff. She yeah. goes on to talk about how she had this kind of relationship with the moon and the stars. She had this feeling of that uh kind of energy so all right a little more here her 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 memoir is pretty um spare when it comes to world war one i think because she was so young but it just she doesn't she mentions it you'd have to mention it but yeah i I mean when she's like a teen she'd be like a teenager when it starts yeah i don't think her father obviously her father didn't die in it Mm -hmm. her brother was too too young young. yeah Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. So here's a little bit more. Uh, In the years before World War I, sport did not feature much in the lives of ordinary people, and men such as Jan, the father of gymnastics, were mocked by intellectuals and caricatured by cartoonists. Oh, later we'll come to Susan Sontag and her Mm -hmm. uh, assessment of the the African, the Nuba tribe photography as being fascist, right? Intellectuals are inclined to think that sport is fascist. (laughs) Yeah, what is up with that, right? <laughs> yeah, I, mm, I, yeah, I can't imagine why why someone like Susan Sontag would think of peak <laughs> athletic performance as implicitly fascist. Mm. Interesting. We'll get into it. Mm-hmm. Um, my father, however, saw some of his, this yawn gymnast uh, performances and greatly admired him. So although I was a dreamy child, I was encouraged from a very early age to be athletic. In his own youth, my father played soccer in Rixdorf, and in later life became interested in boxing and in horse racing. I was only five years old when he made me a life belt out of reeds and threw me into the water. Uh, so, yeah, so she was she had a, an early interest in sports, and then later they would they would go to the track quite frequently. Uh, the The jockeys were kind of. Um, uh, they were like little celebrities, you know, Yeah, literally yeah. little celebrities. Right, yeah. Right. Cool. All right. I've got more here from the memoir. Uh, oh, yes, this is good. So this is about her maternal grandfather, I believe. Yeah. Just to give you a little background on the family here. Who yeah. are we dealing with? Right. Who right. are we dealing with here? All right, yeah, I'm always see. interested in the sort of heritage, like the the, the back a couple generations with the with, with where they're coming from, what their fa- familial context is. It's always interesting. Yeah, and for me, it's so intoxicating because this is a totally different world. We live in a completely different reality. If you drop mm-hmm. any one of these people into like New York City right now, they right. Would, their minds would absolutely be blown. It'd be like Blade Runner for them. Yeah. Um, My maternal grandparents came from West Prussia, but moved to Poland uh, because my grandfather, oh, uh, they're uh, evangelical Protestants. So there there was a, I did a little research into this. She would be confirmed at, I think, 16. Uh, My understanding of it is that the Calvinists and the Lutherans kind of merged during this period, or they attempted to merge them into like a general kind of German Protestant church. Okay. Uh, All right. Talking about her maternal grandfather. He was a master builder. When his first wife died after giving birth to my mother, her 18th child, he married the children's nanny and had three more children. Chad. (laughs) Wow. Lee. Cow. 21 children in all. Whoa. He had an army, had a platoon. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. When Eastern Poland was annexed by Russia, he moved back to Berlin, having no desire to become a Russian citizen. 
The family had to live very frugally, for by now my grandfather was too old to find work, though he looked marvelous to me and seemed always very lively. His youngest daughter, my aunt Tony, never forgave him for fathering 21 children. But I... <laughs> father, it's you, too many. It's, it's yeah, too many. I, I, you should never have had me, Father. <laughs> Goodness. My mother, a good needlewoman, supported her parents by making and selling blouses. But I also recall some other kinds of work. I can dimly see us sitting at a long, wide table gluing cigarette papers. Some of my mother's older brothers and sisters remained in Russia and married there. We never heard from any of them, and they may have perished in the Russian Revolution. My father's parents and their ancestors came from Branden Brandenburg. His father was a locksmith who had three sons and one daughter. I also love all the jobs. Like yeah. These were all real jobs. Locksmith, yeah. Before yeah. fiat currency came and made a, the world of Fugazi, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I'm a locksmith. I'm mm -hmm. a master builder. I install central air. Mm -hmm. I'm a, I can support 21 children as a master builder. <laughs> but in any case, yeah, you need to be a you'd be a, need to be a multimillionaire now to have 21 children. Sure, just go live off the grid and well, yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, my grandmothers on both sides were quiet, gentle women who lived only for their fa families and for their values of their middle class milieu. It was a world in which I never felt quite at home. In that era, it was always thought necessary for a young girl of good background to take piano lessons. Accordingly, twice a week for five years, my father took me to a, a piano teacher who lived on Gentenerstrasse. I must confess that I did not enjoy the lessons at all. I hated practicing, even though I loved music and later as a dancer, I never missed a good concert. With the piano, as with painting, I had some talent, but not enough. I was actually chosen to participate in a student concert and performed a Beethoven sonata quite successfully, but I lacked the passion that I felt so deeply for the art of dance. Hmm. Yes, she she would go on and uh, and dance. Here's a little bit about her adolescence, which I think is important. I had to live with my parents until I was 21. Hmm. All right. Different yeah. time. Yeah. During which time I was never allowed to go out with young men. Nor could I go to a cinema without my parents. It is impossible to convey accurately the difference between adolescence then and that of young people today. My mother all, always made a beautiful dress for me to wear at Whitson, but it always seemed to annoy my father slightly. If a man looked back at me in the street, he would fly into a rage and yell crimson-faced, Keep your eyes drawn. Don't look at men in that way. His rebukes were quite unfair, for it not uh, entered my head to flirt with men. Don't get so excited, Papa, my mother would say soothingly. Lenny doesn't e ever look at men. She was both right and wrong. From the age of 14, I always had to be in love with someone, even though I didn't know my idol personally. For two years, I worshipped a young man I had happened to see only once, but had never spoken to. Every day after school, I walked up and down the street where I'd seen him, hoping to catch another glimpse, but without success. No other male creature existed. Only this one, while it lasted. Yeah. Hmm. So she yeah. did a ro bit of romantic. Quite. Yeah. I've, I saw this guy one time. She was the definition of the romantic, and it yeah. would go come across. And there's there's an interesting if you wanted to do, and I'm sure people have done it. If you wanted to talk about the aesthetic transom between romanticism and so-called fascist aesthetics, that's not that difficult. Yeah, I could see that being. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She talks about her friend Alice and how they would uh, play together. Uh, how on the Kaiser's birthday, they ran up the flag. Uh, or no, no, there was... Okay, let me read this. My friend Alice, with whom I lost touch for a while after her marriage, has reminded me of all sorts of pranks. For example, we climbed up onto the school roof and removed the flag, which was flying there in honor of the Kaiser's birthday. And one day... When there was not the Kaiser's birthday, nor any victory of any kind to celebrate, we ran up the flag in the hope of getting the day off school. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That, that rocks. <laughs> I wasn't afraid of high places and could climb like a monkey. Another time, in order to play truant, I painted Alice's throat, arms, and face with red dots, and 
as there was an epidemic of rubella raging, she was immediately sent home. Two days later, she actually got rubella. Uh, <laughs> <Okay>. Careful. <laughs> yeah. Be careful with the, yeah. right, yeah. with the sympathetic yeah. magic out there. Right. According to Alice, I was incredibly naive at 15, coming to her after my first kiss to ask if a baby would result. It Aww. is true that for a long time, I was not as mature as my girlfriend's. I was embarrassed when Alice showed me her breasts, for I had none. So to look as if I did, I stuffed the front of my blouse with stockings. Alice was already engaged at 15 and married by the time she was 19. I, on the other hand, was still undeveloped at 21 and looked years younger. Hmm. All right. I am going to keep moving along. She talks about her uh, confirmation here. Easter Sunday, 1918. She was confirmed when I was almost 16 at the Kaiser Wilhelm Memorial Church. I can still remember the minister's name, Nitak Stan. He was very handsome and all the girls had a crush on him. My mother had made me a wonderful dress of black ruffled Tula. I don't know that word. Mm. Uh, T-U-L-L-E. Anyway, no. lined with silk in which Alice claimed that I looked more like a femme fatale than a candidate for confirmation. All right. All right. Okay, okay, we're getting into it. We're getting yeah. into it. Um, <laughs> yeah. So let me just check back and make sure I'm keeping us on the rails. Yeah, let's read this. In 1918, when she was 16, it says here she attended a presentation of Snow White again, which interested mm. her deeply, led her to want, uh, to want to be a dancer. Her father instead wanted to provide his daughter with an education that could lead to a more dignified occupation. He wanted her to come and work at the firm. Right. Uh, and and he probably, I, I am assuming, I mean, he probably saw that she was intelligent and capable and, you know, maybe she's going to inherit the firm, right? Sure. Or yeah. at the very least, serve as his executive secretary right? and, and maybe marry someone who could, right? Right. right. It's all yeah. connected. What is father, mm -hmm. what is father dreaming? Right. Very practical man. Mm -hmm. uh, without her husband's knowledge, her mother enrolled Riefenstahl in dance and ballet classes at the Grimm Reiter Dance School in Berlin. I'm not going to roll my R's the entire time, where she quickly <laughs> became a star pupil. And so this is a bit about the Grimm Reiter School. That year when I was 16 brought a turning point in my life, heralded by an advertisement in the newspaper, the Berliner Zeitung, am Mittag. It read, Wanted, 20 young girls for the film, Opium. Apply at the Grimm Reiter School of Dance, Berlin, etc. Wait, what is it? What was it? The the film, the project was called Opium. Uh, Opium. Yeah, yeah. The, I could see not maybe not wanting your daughter involved in that. <laughs> <laughs> you have to understand, like, it, 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 yeah, the stage is not that far away from the brothel, right. and it, it never has been. And everybody wants to now kind of pretend that it's not, but it always has been. It always will be. Mm. You obviously have to go in with clear eyes and uh, clear eyes, full heart. You got to know mm. what you're getting into. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it doesn't mean it, it can't be a respectable profession. And, in, and indeed it can be. But let me tell you, yeah. It, yeah. It, a lot of young hearts get wrecked on the shoals of the stage and film. Sure. For sure. See Mulholland Drive. Yeah, yeah. If you care to see that represented on film. <laughs> uh, I went to the audition purely out of curiosity with no serious intention of going on the stage. If I were chosen, I could easily think up some excuse to turn the offer down. When and it, Come on, how genuine is that, please? Right, She's right, right, cope, right. Yeah. cope. When I entered the auditorium, I found it thronged with young girls, each of whom had to go up to the table where Frau Grimm uh, was sitting. She sized up every applicant with a brief glance, jotting down her name and address. Sometimes she ticked a name, and I was glad to see that she put a tick after mine. I expected to be informed there and then if I had been chosen, but to my disappointment, we were told that we would get in touch. They would get in touch with us later. Just as I was leaving, I paused at a slightly open door through which I glimpsed several young dancers. I heard a piano and a voice commanding, one, two, three, one, two, three. Amid much hopping and stamping, the <laughs> desire to rush inside and join in was almost uncontrollable. 
Against all the rules of common sense, for I knew my father would never consent to it, I asked about the qualifications required and the cost of lessons. Then, without hesitation, I signed up for the beginner's class two hours a week. Uh Apart from the low fees, which I could easily afford, all I needed was a dance smock. There would be, that would be no problem, but keeping the lessons secret from my father would be a major difficulty. (laughs) Fortunately, he would be at the office during the hours in question, but there was still a danger of being found out. My poor mother, who could not resist my passionate insistence, became my confidant and accomplice. And since the lessons were purely for my own pleasure, with no professional goal in mind, we had a We had few scruples of conscience. Now I had to lie in wait for the postman every morning, lest the longed-for letter should fall into my father's hands. How dramatic is all this? I love it. Right. In the event, it was intercepted quite soon without difficulty. The selected girls were to report back to the Grimm Writer School. This time, however, I found a much smaller number of applicants, each of whom had to dance a waltz before the casting jury. Delighted as I was to be selected, along with several others, I knew I could not take advantage of this opportunity, and I said so at once to the disappointed director. She had to turn it down. Yeah. He, Dad, if you show up on the screen, I mean, yeah, you're not going to even be able to make the day's shooting. Yeah. Right. It's one thing to make a have a class that you're doing in secret. It's another to be launching into a career of some kind. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Tell me about it. Yeah. <laughs> The secret dance class was my compensation, however, and my enthusiasm grew with every lesson. At first, I was too tense and not particularly skillful, but technically I found it all very easy because of my training in gymnastics and various sports. After five or six lessons, my muscles relaxed and my limbs and body began to respond to the music. From then on, my progress was very rapid and I became one of the best pupils in a very short time. When I had been attending classes for three months, My father still knew nothing, and encouraged by this, I decided to take ballet lessons, too. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Many such stories begin this way. Mm -hmm. He doesn't Mm -hmm. know now. All right, let's start meeting twice a week. Yeah, we'll we'll push it. We'll push it a little Mm -hmm. bit. Yeah, the ballet ballet lessons would mean going to the school four times a week. This (laughs) I did, and soon I was dancing on points. No pain or strain was too great for me. I practiced many hours a day outside school time using every rail or banister for that purpose. I made my friends flex my limbs so that they could move as easily as those of a rubber doll. Hmm. Uh, Even in the street, I would do great leaps and entrechettes, paying no heed to the stares and shaking heads of passersby. I could always concentrate entirely, entirely on whatever interested me. Ah, uh, yeah, quite indifferent to what others might say or think about it. And during those weeks and months, I cocooned myself into a world of my own. Something an artist, very helpful to have that yeah. cocoon as an artist. Yeah. yeah. When you're yeah. germinating an idea or you developing. You don't care about whatever else. This is all that matters. Yep. I'm writing my novel. Yep. <clears throat> I'm making my podcast. Mm-hmm. Already each of my friends had a boyfriend, and the experiences which excited them most were all about flirting with men. I showed not the least interest in any of that. Of course, I had thought myself deeply in love several times, but these were mere infatuations with boys I had never even a close, uh, never was never even close to in any sense. My feelings were poured into my dancing. And this is how she treats World War I. It was now 1918, and the war was over. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> life on easy mode. <laughs> Big time life on easy mode. Lenny, compared yeah. to some of the childhoods we've covered, Lenny has it pretty sweet. Yeah, you compare, uh, well, yeah, and compare what uh, Yunga. To like Marilyn. Doing. Yeah, or Yunga. Yeah, <laughs> During right. that same time. Then yeah. he's like, oh, God, if father <laughs> finds that I am taking ballet, he will be, he will be upset. <laughs> like literally Jungers like dodging grenades. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was now 1980. This is the understatement of the century. I'm declaring right. it. Yeah. It was now 1918 and the war was over. We had lost. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, nine. <laughs> oh, ah, uh, Scheisse. <laughs> what could go <laughs> 
what could go wrong? Oh no, we had li- yeah. surely the allies will be generous and conciliatory mm-hmm. in their mm-hmm. uh, in their treatment of of Germany after right. World War One. They yeah. certainly don't want it to happen again. Right. Right. No, she's 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 saying it like they lost the World Cup or something. <laughs> it's like it's right. a disappointment, but uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we had lost. <laughs> there had been a revolution and there was no Kaiser, no king, but I experienced all these things in a cloud of unknowing. My mind was turned in on a tiny exclusive world. Kind of admire it. Yeah. Good way yeah, to cope. You're a yeah. young woman yeah. with artistic sensibilities. Focus on that. Yeah, she's not on Twitter all day, like right. railing against the the contemptuous nature of present day society. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, touch grass. Mm-hmm. During that period in the winter of nineteen eighteen or the spring of nineteen uh, nineteen, I was once briefly involved in street fighting when an elevated train on which my mother and I were traveling was spattered with bullets. We all had to lie down and the lights went out. As we hurried home later, shots whistled past us and we had to dash from entrance hall to entrance hall seeking cover. I had not the faintest notion why this was happening or what it meant. The word politics was not yet part of my vocabulary and my reaction to anything connected with the war was a shudder of revulsion. To my shame, I must confess that patriotism as such was alien to me in my youth. For me, war was the ultimate evil and extreme nationalism was usually responsible for war's very existence. All human beings, black, white, or red, had the same value for me, and I had never even heard of racist theories. Hmm. It could be said that my head was in the clouds, for my interests, apart from dancing, were in the mysteries of outer space and in the planets, in the cosmos itself. The stars, and especially the moon, still exercised an irresistible fascination. Hmm. I don't know that I'll cover it here in the memoir, but she does talk about encountering Einstein's theory of re- relativity and it just like rocking her. Wow. She's that kind of a mind. Yeah. Right. Smart. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Smart cookie. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Well, let's, let's read a little more here. This is the early part of the memoir is going to occupy quite a bit of our time because I think it's so essential to really understanding her character. Now that I was 16 and had completed my schooling, a decision had to be made about my future. My father, determined to cure me of my obsession with acting, wished to send me to a domestic science college, the prestigious Letterhaus in Berlin, and then to finishing school. All my appeals for training in drama made him so furious that for my mother's sake, I gave up and concentrated instead on finding some way to prevent my exile to a boarding school. The very thought of that was unendurable. Mm Mm-hmm has a little bit about the racetrack here. They would go uh, to the track quite frequently. Uh, Now, we get to the part of this called my first public performance. Uh, Well, Uh, yeah, well, I I don't want to get out of line here because it skips around in time a little bit. I'll mention it a little later. We got to get to some interesting stuff. Like her okay. first uh, sexual encounter is brutal. Oh, no. Fascinating and brutal. It's going to be mm. very interesting. Uh, I just want to make sure I don't miss the introduction to one of the critical characters. Ah, yeah. So let me. So this is the racetrack. I have to cover this. It's too important. I have to introduce this character. My best friend Hertha usually came to the races with us and wearing the blue and white ribbons of the Weinberg stable, we cheered and suffered with Otto Schmidt. Otto Schmidt is the, um, the uh, one of the uh, jockeys. Sometimes I asked Hertha whether she thought that Otto Schmidt sitting high in his mount ever happened to look at my adoring eyes, and she usually said that of course he had. I did not believe it for a minute, for jockeys, just like performers on stage, seldom see clearly anyone in the audience. Several times I had tried to make contact with this demigod, but to no avail. He was too shy and retiring. There was, however, another well-known and popular jockey named Rastenberger, in personality utterly different from Schmidt. Lively and gregarious, he often talked to members of the public, and one day, after eyeing me for some time, he came over and spoke to me. Now, this is the effect she would have. My father being being nowhere about, I was free to chat. Rostenberger was astonished by my knowledge of thoroughbreds and their pedigrees. 
not only those of the Weinberg stable, but those of all the major stables and stud farms. I had studied the subject because of Otto Schmidt and processed statistically all the information I collected. I was practi- It was practically a doctoral dissertation, and I still have it today. The thick black notebook with the calico cover in which for years I entered the ancestry and the successes of the horses. It is one of the few relics of my very early youth that has remained with me. Rostenberger, very impressed, suggested that we meet sometime, and rather nervously, I agreed. Though it, I stipulated that I could see him only in the afternoon. We're going to go for lunch, not dinner. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're too short for dinner. Yeah. The rendezvous <laughs> was at a restaurant on, F- F- oh, I want to get this right, Friedrichstrasse. And oh, it's so tough, those R's. And he was waiting for me outside on the pavement. I was 17, and this was my first date. Yet, when I found myself in a room with no other diners, the walls, sofa, and even the table covered in red velvet, I knew at once what kind of room it was and what I had let myself in for. Oh, boy. Rostenberger had ordered champagne, and as our glasses clinked, he put his arm around me. Carefully, I extricated myself and began to chatter about Otto Schmidt, who was the only reason I had agreed to see his fellow jockey. Ooh, Ooh, getting thrown in the the jockey zone. Yeah. (laughs) Rostenberger had no interest whatsoever in talking about Schmidt. Ah, Schmidt, he's a hack. Mm -hmm. Or in my lying disclosure that I was Otto's cousin. Dismissing my suggestion that we should visit my cousin, he seized me roughly in his arms and tried to kiss me. Then as I pulled away and fled, he pursued me downstairs and into the street. Outside, it was raining heavily, and as a perfect end to this adventure, I found myself being beaten about the head by a woman I had never seen. It was Frau Rostenberger. Oh, my God. All right. Oh that isn't the incident I was thinking right. about. Right. But this that's is a creepy. Oh, my God. Babylon Berlin, man. That's yeah. the scene we're in right now. Yeah. See, how old is yeah. she? 17. So we're 17. talking. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. I want you to uh I'm gonna I'm gonna stand up for 60 seconds. Where are you at right now with Lenny? Well, I you know, she's got an interesting childhood, not uh particularly traumatic or anything yet, although this incident with her at 17 is pretty intense. Um, you know, we've got some kind of standard uh artistic mythological fare here with the sort of stern father who's has no interest in the nonsense that is uh, art- artistic or creative output, and then the mother supporting it. So there, there is, and, and then there's this obsession with Snow White. I do have there's something like a little bit of a fairy tale vibe here. The World War One didn't really seem to touch her too much. Um, there's, yeah, there, there's a little bit of a there's a little bit of a fairy tale going on so far. But but you know, like fairy tales, like Snow, White, there's darkness. Right. There is, there's this stuff is sort of out there someplace. It's a dangerous world, clearly. Yeah. Mm. And and you see these things like this with this Rosterberg guy, which is like, you know, we kind of we kind of, uh, uh, you know, look askance at those old forms of courting and things. Right. Where, you know, there's a chaperone and it's all very uptight. And we look we look askance at that. But then like. She goes on this one little unapproved venture and like basically, you know, almost gets raped by this married man. We're like, well, man, maybe those rules were there for a reason. I, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Tricky <laughs> business. Yeah. Tricky business. My first public performance. My father still knew nothing about my dance classes. Every Tuesday and Friday, I roller skated all the way to the entrance of the school and I got away with my deception until a terrible day of reckoning. Every year, Frau Grimreiter's students gave a display, and this particular year, she was delighted to have a star attraction. Anita Berber, a former student and now a famous dancer who sometimes practiced at the school, had agreed to perform. I had so often watched her practicing and in private had so often imitated her every movement that when three days before the recital, she dropped out through illness, it occurred to me that I might do as a replacement. Frau Grimm Reiter was as doubtful was doubtful at first, but after I performed one or two of Beba's dances, she agreed, providing we could find suitable costumes. This was no problem, and it was only when everything was arranged that I thought of my father. 
There being no hope of obtaining his permission, my mother contrived to have him invited to a card party with friends. The only other person who knew the secret was my brother, and he was to be in the audience for, for my first public performance as a dancer. Nearly all the spectators were friends and relatives of the students. Oddly enough, although I was trembling with excitement, I felt no stage fright. And when my cue finally came, I glided across the stage as though I had been performing all my life. The applause was so loud and insistent that I had to respond with several encores. I was numb with happiness. When it was over, I knew that this alone must be my life and my world. But my delight was short-lived. Having seen my performance, a family friend innocently congratulated my father on having so gifted a daughter. Oh. My father's anger was such that the first thing he did was to instruct a lawyer to initiate divorce proceedings against my mother. Wow. Only now did I begin to realize the extent of the crisis I had provoked and my desire by my desire to go on the stage. My mother had assisted me in deceiving my father and had secretly made me costumes. She was to suffer and I could not bear to see it. I decided to give up. I begged him to stop the divorce and I would bury all my dreams and longings, but he did not trust me. I was to be sent to boarding school. From the age of 13, I had suffered from bilious colic. She had a gall gallbladder issue. Mm -hmm. She would later get it removed. Okay. And this illness helped me in the efforts to avoid being sent away from home. Perhaps it was the distress I was causing in the family that brought on my attacks of colic, but for whatever reason, I was in agony for several days and my father saw it and suffered with me. I began to feel very sorry for him and to realize how deeply he loved me, for he was in such a state that he could not enjoy anything. He knew that I was ill with longing to be allowed to train for the theater, but to him the stage was one step up from the gutter and he could not yield. My awareness that the happiness of an entire family was being destroyed because of me, that my brother, my father, and most of all, my mother were victims of my obsession, sent me to my father in penitence. I told him that, for his sake, I would study painting, though at first he eyed me doubtfully. My sincerity convinced him, and he sighed with relief. The very next day, he enrolled me at the State School of Arts and Crafts on Prince Albrechtstrasse. Listening, I presented... Uh, listlessly, I presented myself to sit the qualifying examination among a hundred other young applicants, male and female. We had to do several nude drawings, some portraits, and other wor work of our own choosing. Only two of the hundred were accepted, and I was one of them. Wow. All right. So again, this is who we're dealing with. She's like, I'm not a very good pager, but I got in. Yeah, I'm just better than everybody else. That's all. Yeah, I just, yeah, yeah this is my safety <laughs> school. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good for her. Yeah. But I felt no joy in an honor which would probably seal my fate. I went faithfully to college every day, but fell deeper and deeper into a profound depression, which my father could not fail to notice. So now she gets sent to, uh, <laughs> without saying a word to anyone, my father began to send away for brochures from boarding schools. <laughs> 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 so... Mm -hmm. Ah, boy. Man, we, we really don't have that looming as a threat anymore over the middle class, do we? No, I feel like the only kids are like what you do. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know anybody who went to boarding school. I know kind exactly. Of school. I dated exactly one person. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I knew some hoodlums. You know what I mean? <laughs> like I knew some people who were definitely going the wrong direction. And yeah. So, yeah, it doesn't seem like it's really a phenomena for us anymore. No, no. Maybe we don't have a middle class anymore. That could be mm, why. Could be. Uh, hmm. In any case, uh, she was, in 1919, sent to the Loman School in Tala in the Hearts Mountains. And uh, she secretly packed her ballet uh, slippers. And... She says, it hadn't occurred to my father that in such a finishing school, staging plays is usually part of the curriculum. <laughs> right. <laughs> Nor apparently had anybody told him. I became a leading performer, played all kinds of parts and directed dramas myself. I appeared as a hunchbacked woman in the Pied Piper of Hamelin. I played Faust in the old German play, The Descent of Dr. Faust into Hell. Hmm. 
Furthermore, we were allowed to attend the outdoor theater in Tala every weekend to see such classics as Schiller's The Brigand, Lesson, Lessing's uh, Minna von Barnhelm, and Faust. Uh, so he basically sent her to theater school accidentally. Kind of sent her to theater camp. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> had Fräulein okay. had any suspicion of how these performances were stirring up all my repressed desires, she would never have allowed me to go. Hmm. Neither would she or my father have approved of the letter I sent to my friend in Berlin during my time at Tala. Dear Alice, I'm afraid I'm growing more and more serious, and I don't know why. I think too much and sometimes feel that I'm going mad, yet I can't do foolish things anymore, and really I'm becoming too sensible. I feel as if I am already 20 to 30 years old, but can't decide whether this is to my advantage or disadvantage. Everything seems so ridiculous, and people most of all. I've actually started to write, can you imagine? Already I've penned a few articles that I'd like to send to Sports World, if only I could pluck up the courage, and I hope to write a few short stories for Film Week. I am also working on a film scenario, but I intend to keep that to myself for someday I'd like to play the leading role. The title is to be Queen of the Turf. And we're talking about a 17-year-old here. Mm -hmm. And it consists of a prologue and, and six acts. I do hope I succeed in this. I have also worked out something about civilian air travel, which I think is to come soon. And I've done several drawings in this connection. Uh, of course, it's all just fantasy. How I wish I were a man. It would be so much easier to carry out all my plans. Let's put mm -hmm. another asterisk, asterisk next to Lenny, mm -hmm. along with Control F Hitler, the fact mm -hmm. that he did all of this as a woman. And I think that's right. one of the reasons they struggle so mightily with her, because she she broke through the, mm -hmm. the glass ceiling right. at, to about as high as someone could accomplish and changed mm -hmm. her industry, changed her her art. Mm -hmm. uh pulled a like a like a tiger woods on film yeah. changed the game yeah as a woman yeah in the 30s and the 40s mm -hmm. right yeah. and how do we deal with that mm -hmm. yeah incredible uh before i left boarding school my father demanded that i come to some decision about what kind of professional training i wish to take up for i seemed unable to make up my mind about what would be my next step my heroine was the Polish scientist, Madame Curie, whom I admired for her willpower and her almost obsessive devotion to her work. A life of such self-sacrifice seemed to me to be an ideal worth striving for, yet interested as I was in science, I worried less, be, uh, less because of my love of art and my strongly emotional nature, I would fail to find fulfillment in a purely scientific career. The real reason, however, for my indecision was probably my inability to con contemplate giving up dancing, which by now was more important to me than acting. Then, I had a rather clever idea. My father had always nursed a desire to have me work in his office as his private secretary and confidant, and it occurred to me that if I suggested doing this, he might very well be prepared to allow me to go on with my dancing, provided, of course, that I promised never to go on the stage. I thought it all out very carefully and then wrote a tactful letter to my father. His reply, when it came, sent me into ecstasies. He agreed to everything. Wow. Okay. Your dad's happy. Oh, she wants to come at the film. It's going right. to be great. Right. right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. She uh, danced on the weekend. Lenny, she, yeah. yeah, right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. We'll take care of, of Lenny. She'll meet a nice man. Mm -hmm. She'll get, yeah, these dreams will will fall out of her head. Right. Um, right. Yeah. Instead now another... of recognizing the fact that she's like some kind of powerhouse in training, right? Like, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. <clears throat> well, it, the, the payoff here is going to be delicious. Trust mm -hmm. me. All right. Mm -hmm. Let me make sure I'm staying on my track. I am. Uh, I just think it's so important with these characters to, to emphasize the early life and the formative years because it all pays off when you get into the the works that we all know mm -hmm. it, because it all may, begins to make sense um nobody emerges from a uh, the abyss everybody right, comes from right. from somewhere yeah. so this is a chapter about uh tennis so she's dancing she's working at her father's office she's in charge of the petty cash he had no objections uh, to her taking tennis lessons at the Berlin Ice Skating Club, which is, that's kind of funny. Hmm. So what, uh, do they, 
do they give ice skating lessons at the, at the tennis club? What's the deal here? Right. Um, he had friends there who would keep an eye on me. Hmm. Uh, from then on, I spent many hours on the tennis courts and made many friends there, two of whom were my tennis coaches. Many years later, I cast one of them, Max Holtzbauer, uh, into a, two of my films. So she would, she directed more other, she directed features. And we'll, we'll cover them. Mm -hmm. uh, my other teacher, Gunter Rahn, had once been an adjutant to His Royal Highness, the Crown Prince Wilhelm, Wilhelm, mm -hmm. and he gave me lessons really because he had fallen in love with me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We lost the war. Yeah, he gave me lessons because he fell in love. He had fallen in love with me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there was something going on around on the bird website recently where it was like one of these green text things. I don't know if it was a green text thing, but it's just some e-girl, some Twitch streamer who discovered that she has like guys who love her all mm -hmm. around the world. Mm -hmm. And she's just she's just started traveling and like staying with them. <laughs> and like oh obviously God. she's just running up, running up the body count, but like she's like, have I discovered a cheat code? Like you kind of want to go like kinda yeah like, yeah but that it could end very poorly. I I mean there's all sorts of short, medium, and long term hazards to that. I will say no doubt. Yeah. But this oh is yeah another... this random mm -hmm. this random guy who on the internet who's obsessed with me. I think I'll fly to his town where I don't know anybody else and I'll stay with him for a while. Right. I I hope she's doing appropriate. I guess yeah. what you would call it, it would be maybe OPSEC or appropriate yeah. vetting. Right. Uh, but again, this goes on the bingo card. Nothing right. changes. Right. right. Nothing right. changes. Yeah. Around that time, something very strange occurred. I was in the locker room when a man opened the door and gazed at me for a long time with rather vague gray eyes and then closed the door. I like how she writes all of this too. Like the effect mm -hmm. that she has on men is never stated outright, but she... Mm -hmm dances around it. Yeah, she's showing that telling for sure. Mm. For some reason, I found the incident very disturbing and it took me some time to recover from the tension that followed and from a feeling that I can only describe as being like an electric shock. Nothing like it had ever happened before. The finals of the National Tennis Championships were held at the Ice Skating Club and when I saw Otto Freutzheim, the top German tennis player, I recognized the man whose appearance at the locker room door had so confused me. So mm, and it was like the equivalent of Federer was mm -hmm. looking at her, not to bring Federer into this, but to give right. you like a temporary comparison. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Uh, he was much gossiped about not only because of his prowess at tennis, but also because of his innumerable love affairs. I made up my mind to avoid him as best I could, having no desire to be counted among the conquests of this Lothario. <laughs> I All love right. the word Lothario. <laughs> yeah, we need to return to Lothario. Yeah. It's it's quite a good word. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to make sure that I cover everything. Let's see. Yeah, she's she's really. Yeah, this is about her father. As so often happens, however, things worked out very differently. The very next day, one of my father's clerks appeared and asked me to report to the office where my father wished to see me. My mother had mm -hmm. guessed where I might be found. He looked composed as I faced him. She, she fled home and went to stay with her grandmother mm -hmm. after an argument. At one point, um, let's see here. The father started um, behaving very, very cold, coldly to her. And he roared at her like a madman. I know you have been lying to me. You are still planning to go on the stage. The job as my secretary is only to fool me. And you have never had any intention of keeping your promise. You are no daughter of mine. Oh boy. So she goes to stay with the grandmother. And then he calls her. And he, uh, she writes, he looked composed as I faced him with wildly beating heart, determined to hold on my uh, fiercely to my new one freedom. But he was forcing himself to be calm, exercising great self-control. As he spoke the words I had expected never to hear. Yeah. You mm -hmm. are as stubborn as I am, he told me. And for your mother's sake only, I am willing to consent to your training as a dancer. Personally, I am convinced that you have little talent and will never be more than mediocre. 
but you will have no cause to say later on that I destroyed your life or ruined your chances of a career. You will receive the best possible training and everything else will depend on you and you alone. Wow. He paused and I pitied him for I could see what it cost him to make this speech. I heard the bitterness in his voice as he went on. I hope that I shall never suffer the mortification someday of seeing your name among newspaper advertisements. I flinched at this, and yet I was deeply grateful. Even as he spoke those harsh words, I swore in my heart that I would never do anything to disappoint him. Hmm. That very day, he took me to an excellent ballet teacher, Eugenie Eduardova, a once famous ballerina from St. Petersburg, to whom he repeated his belief that I lacked any talent worth speaking of and that he was merely indulging my whim. His parting advice to her was that she should exercise great severity when instructing me. Nobody was happier than my, my mother when I came home to Zoyton with my father that evening. And now a wonderful time began for me. Even though the dancing lessons and the exercises were exceedingly strenuous, at 19, I was really too old to be training for the ballet among students who had started at the age of six or eight. And I frankly mm -hmm. think this is what caused some of her injuries. I don't think yeah. that you can train ballet. I'm not an expert at this, I, uh, but I, yeah. I suspect that if you try to get to an elite level later in life without the muscle memory of the earlier training, it, it's probably pretty risky. Yeah, I've heard things like this. I mean, I think ballet in general is pretty has pretty disastrous effects on your body, but yeah, to come into it later is probably mm -hmm. even worse. Yeah. Yeah. Here, here she writes, I had tried to close the enormous gap between them and me. I had to try. I trained and practiced until only my willpower prevented me from passing out. And thanks to my early training in athletics, I succeeded so well that within a few months, I could stay on points for several minutes. And by the end of the year, I was among the best. Mm -hmm. uh, the teacher, a remarkable woman and a marvelous uh, instructor, was satisfied with me. And for my part, I truly revered her then and always. Mm -hmm. The next chapter is called A Tragedy of Young Love. Uh, and I don't want to skip anything. So how old is she? Uh, how old is she at this time? Uh, she's got to be 18, 19. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 19. You said, yep. Yeah. Let me read this. There's a fellow. This is very important. <laughs> Again, about the effect she would have on men. So they would take the train every day. Quite soon, these evening train journeys became a nerve-wracking ordeal because of Walter Lebowski's obsession with me. I had done everything to avoid arousing any hope of him. Yet every uh, evening, when we took the train to Zoyton, Walter entered our compartment and sat facing me, dressed always in black and wearing huge, dark sunglasses. It frightened me. My father did not know him. But he noticed that the same young man in sunglasses sat with us on each evening trip. We never exchanged a word, and this behavior could not have been more foolish since it only made me dislike Walter more and more. One winter evening, we were all at home. My friend Hertha had come to stay, and she chatted happily with my mother while my father and I played billiards. There was a storm howling outside, and eventually my parents said goodnight and went upstairs to bed. I could hear the shutters in my bedroom banging to and fro. And we were about to follow my parents upstairs when there was a knock on the door. We looked at each other in alarm. Who could be there at this time of night? We stood by the door, petrified. After a while, there was another knock, and I thought I heard a plaintive voice. I was reluctant to disturb my father at midnight, so I opened the door a crack. And to my horror, I saw Walter standing in the snowstorm, rigid oh, with cold. We pulled him inside though I knew I would be beaten if my father came down and found him there, but he would have frozen to death if we had left him outside. We dragged him upstairs to my room, took off his wet outer clothes, dried him as best we could, and got him into bed. Hertha made some tea, which we poured into him through his chattering teeth. Between swallows, he whimpered, but he was unable to speak. After about an hour, he appeared to fall asleep, and we tiptoed to the ne room next to mine and to, uh, to try to work out what was to be done with him without my father finding out. Suddenly we heard moans and rushed back to my room. Walter's right arm dangled out of the bed almost to the floor where a pool of blood had collected. And there was blood on the bed covers. He had cut his wrists and then passed out. Oh my In our God. Fright and horror. We did what we could. I ripped up a towel and bound up the wound. 
Well, Hertha tried to bring him around by applying compresses, compresses to his face and body. After some time, he began to moan. He was still alive. When dawn came, we managed to carry him into the next room, place him under the couch, and shut the door. Then, having wiped away all traces of blood, we waited anxiously for my parents to rise. My father noticed nothing amiss, and we were so terrified of him that we said nothing. In the kitchen, we told my mother and left her to take in the dreadful events of the night and to shoulder responsibility for saving Walter's life, since Hertha and I willy-nilly must travel to Berlin with my father. My mother whispered that she would immediately fetch a doctor and have Walter taken to hospital. Well, we must notify Walter's family. He did not die, but was sent for a long period of time to a mental hospital and never allowed to see me again, lest it bring about a relapse. Later, his family moved to America. Oh, he's going to fit in great over here. Yeah. 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 You belong over here, kid. Where he slowly recovered and was eventually able to resume his studies and became a professor of mathematics in San Francisco. Yeah. Good job, buddy. Many, <laughs> many years later, how many Lenny's can I count? I yeah. spy three, I feel Lenny's, five Lenny's, six Lenny's, six Lenny's, uh, oh. even Lenny's. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Many years, that's quite amusing. Many years <laughs> later, after the war, he did visit me and my mother in Kitzbühel, for he never forgot me as long as he lived. At the end of his days, he was almost totally blind. Mm. Uh, there was one incident that Wild. I may have skipped over, so I want to see if I can find it. There's a very interesting incident that happened in Berlin. I'm looking it up in the... Uh, uh, I, I like this notion that all this stuff happens under her dad's nose and he's just like oblivious. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like dudes killing him killing themselves in Lenny's bedroom. She's, you know, <laughs> doing stage performances. <laughs> it's it's wild. It's he really wild. Off the feeder camp on accident. Yeah. I'm I skipped another formative incident. And this is so we're gonna flash back in time a little bit and okay. then come yeah. forward. But this yeah. happened when she was very young and well the first thing that happens is that the vegetable vegetable market i was the ringleader in this escapade which involved knocking over the baskets in the hope of grabbing a few of the rolling apples so they're going to try to steal fruit from the vegetable garden okay. or from the vegetable market when my father found out i was severely beaten and locked in a dark room for an entire day Jeez. This was not the only occasion in which I suffered from my father's strict ideas about discipline. Ah, now, this yeah, is, you're stealing stuff. There's got to be some repercussions, but then yeah, lock locking it, lock it her in a closet or a room for it. It's a little much. Yeah. 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 Uh, now, listen mm -hmm. to this. When we lived in Hermannsplatz, I had a truly terrible experience. At that time, a, a particularly brutal sex murderer of children was at large in Berlin. <laughs> Woo! A particularly brutal. Yeah, you, unlike you're you're just you're uh, running yeah, the mil mills. I'm telling you what, this sex, sex murderer murders. of children was is not mid. He's particularly <laughs> brutal. A particularly brutal sex murderer of children. A man who <laughs> mutilated children before killing them, and of whom everyone was mortally afraid. Wow, I shouldn't be laughing. Sorry. <laughs> that I mean. <laughs> That, that is a, kind of an amusing turn of phrase, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. It's just like, oh, uh, you know, we have another uh, yeah. sex murder of children. This one's really bad. Yeah. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> one evening, my father sent me out for beer to a tavern only a few minutes walk from our flat. I ran downstairs with a siphon. Mm. That, that's what we uh, called the type of beer tankard with a lid of white porcelain. Mm. So like a... What do they call those things? Like a handle? They have a word for those now. In any case. I and I saw a man, a growler. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I saw a man standing at the staircase window with his back to me. He looked somehow menacing because, of course, the window was in darkness and nothing could be seen from it. So why was he there? I scurried past him, hoping he would be gone when I returned. But once back with the filled tankard, I did not dare enter the building. I stood outside terrified, all too aware that since we had no telephone, there was no way of notifying my parents, yet not wanting to stay out in the streets at night. At last, I made up my mind. I started for the stairs, and there he stood, straddle-legged, as before, silently gazing into the darkness beyond the window. 
clutching the beer siphon. I dashed past him and took the stairs two at a time, but I did not get very far before he grabbed me by the coat collar. I dropped the beer and screamed for help. Next, his hands were round my throat as I was, and I was choking, but at the same instant doors were being pulled open by neighbors alarmed by the noise and the man really released me and fled to this day. I feel a chill of horror when I hear footsteps behind me. Oh my gosh. Yeah. They got killed. Yeah. If that's to be believed. Right. Yeah. Wow. Mm. Yeah. Brutal. Huh? Mm. All right. So let's get into the, uh, the dancing career here. Oh, here's how she handles uh she literally has a chapter called inflation coming attractions people <laughs> coming to coming to why america why america it's here here we go this is really really funny the way she handles this the next morning brought us an awful shock we were in the grip of inflation our nah. money was worthless nah uh you know i mean and it just goes on you know right. they, they, they literally can't <laughs> suddenly you literally can't get food yeah, tur- uh, turns out money's not worth anything anymore. Huh. <laughs> Would you look at that? <laughs> There's also the- a particularly brutal uh, international <laughs> child sex war. murderer. Yeah. Oh, sure, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're having good times. Good times right. in Berlin. Good times in Berlin. Mm. All right. So this is a critical, pivotal moment, <clears throat> and is going to get us into kind of her her full fledged uh, dance and career. A beauty contest was to be held at the Zoo Banquet Hall in Berlin. My father was away hunting for the weekend. And so I think it's funny that you would host a beauty contest at, I assume, the zoo. It says zoo. That's (laughs) kind of perfect. Yeah, yeah. And so I was able to attend the festivities with my mother. She had made me a lovely silvery green silk gown trimmed with a border of white swan feathers. The poster said that the competitors would include film stars such as Lee Perry, a well-known and very beautiful blonde screen actress from Munich. I was becoming more and more fascinated by the theater and the cinema because my life had always been so narrowly bourgeois. But uh, not unexpectedly, Lee Perry, wearing a white tulle dress trimmed with, I'm just going to pronounce that 10 different ways, and at one point I'll get it right. I'm going to look up what it is in the background. D-U-L-L-E, what is that? It must be a kind of fabric. Uh, trimmed with silver spangles, won first prize. The second prize, and I thought I would sink through the floor, was awarded to me. Mm. That's who we're dealing with. Mm-hmm. Movie star good looks. Mm-hmm. Right? And naive. Amid thunderous applause, I was taken down from the stage, and to my mother's dismay, two men hoisted me on their shoulders and carried me through the room. I feared the photographer's flashes even more than the dangerous throng, for there was no telling what my father would do if he saw my pictures in the paper. Why do you go to these things if you if you don't think you're going to win, Lenny? <laughs> right, right. I, They're all like, just like, well, I didn't mean to actually win it. I just, yeah, I feel like yeah. it's 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 a little bit of a uh, a little bit of cope. They're playing a little bit of a game, and they're kind of cucking yeah. her dad a bit. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, mm. just he's got to be. I, I, He's got to be losing his mind. By I'm him. right <laughs> here, Letty. I'm always right here. Right. In German. Right. <laughs> you ready to hear somebody scream in German? Yeah. Yeah. I bet you thought it was going to be mostly Hitler on this right. episode. No, it's mostly no, it's Letty's Letty's Lenny. father. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, tool is a form of netting that is made of small gauge thread netted in a hexagonal pattern with small oh. openings and frequently starched to provide body or stiffness. It's a sort of a fabric you wouldn't use necessarily as the primary thing, but you use to make dresses mm. flouncy in that sure. sort of thing. Sure. And maybe it Very shows light. a little skin. Yeah. Because it's yeah. Got... It's, it's slightly mm. transparent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 Okay. Flowers and calling cards were handed to me, and many people asked for my name and and address. I had a very difficult time extricating myself from the crowd and getting back to my mother. We both felt very guilty, but luckily my father never found out about the beauty contest. Yeah, sure. Among the cards I received, I noticed two names, which I knew from magazines. One was F.W. Kübner, editor-in-chief of a renowned fashion journal called Dame, I think. The other was Karl Vollmüller, author of the play Miracle, staged so opulently by Max Reinhardt. 
he was known to be friendly with Reinhardt. Volmuller had scrawled something on his card. I would be delighted to meet you and to help you professionally. Yeah, yeah. Wink. Kebner's message read, you are very beautiful. I can promise you a great career. Wink. Also wink. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One afternoon, I visited Herr Kebner, who lived in a ground floor apartment in the western area of Berlin. A young maid opened the door and led me to a room which came as quite a surprise. All four walls were covered with photographs showing nothing but legs, no bodies, no faces, just legs. Hmm. Then Kebner came in, slender, rather tall, his clothes elegantly casual, and greeted me with a slightly leering smile that instantly aroused my antipathy. The first thing he said was, show me your legs, my lovely. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Almost a foot guy. Almost right. a foot Almost. guy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was stunned, for I was wearing a fairly short skirt. But you can see my legs, I said. Please, just pull your skirt a little higher, over your knees. So a short skirt <laughs> short down skirt. past the knees. <laughs> yeah. We're not Ooh. talking about your ankles, honey. Uh. <laughs> Scandalous, Lenny. Oh, is it hot in here? I'm wearing a turtleneck here. I don't know. Hmm. She was asking for it. You wore a skirt like that. <laughs> That was me impersonating her dad. Yeah, of course. Yeah, let me see. Let me see your knees. Ah, oh, goodness. Um, foolishly, I drew it at Art of Dark Pod. If you want to get a Brad <laughs> on Twitter, on Twitter. <laughs> foolishly, I drew. <laughs> I drew it halfway up my thighs, then dropped it again. What's all this about? I asked in annoyance. Condescendingly, he mentioned motioned me to a chair and said, as if offering me a magnificent present. I have something special in mind for you. If you can dance only half as well as your legs suggest, I'll get you a solo dance number at La Scala. La Scala was Berlin's biggest vaudeville theater, and its international program was world famous. If Herr Kebner thought I would be so overjoyed that I would throw my arms around him or let a, out a shriek of delight, he must have been very disappointed. I reflected for an instant, then said with a rather conceited grin, but Herr Kebner, I've never had any intention of appearing at a vaudeville house, even one as famous as La Scala. I'm going to dance only in concert halls and on theater platforms. I'm an artist. Yeah. Hey. Dang, I'm an artist. Right. He stared at me as if I were a freak. Then, offended, he opened the door. Goodbye and good luck, he said as I left. My visit to Herr Dr. Volmuller was entirely different. Actually, after my encounter with Herr Kebner, I didn't feel much like meeting any other strangers uh, from the beauty contest. Fair enough. Yet I felt it was worth seeing this playwright. Uh-oh. Mm, the of worst of the worst. Oh, the bottom <laughs> of the barrel. Her dad was right. <laughs> uh, because of his collaboration with Max Reinhardt, whose production at the Deutsche Theater and the Kammerspiel I hardly ever missed. So one afternoon, I stood at on Platz outside a luxurious building near the Brandenburg Gate. It was on the side where, 10 years later, uh, Goebbels would occupy his ministerial offices, and I would be in much the same situation as I was now with Dr. Mm. Volmuller. Oh boy. We'll get to it. We haven't even introduced the full cast of characters no. on the no. Lenny Riefenstahl episode of Art of Darkness, artofdarkpod.com. Patreon.com slash Art of Dark Pod. I hope you're enjoying it as we go. A butler led me to an elegant, thickly carpeted room full of antique furniture and costly paintings. Everything was in perfect harmony and taste. Nothing was overdone. Softly, almost inaudibly, Dr. Volmuller entered the room. He had an air of refinement, and in this ambiance, I could picture him in the costume of a bygone age. His face was lean, his eyes bright, and he had sparse, light brown hair. He greeted me with a kiss on my hand, the first I had ever received. The butler served tea and cake, and I was offered a cigarette, which I declined with thanks. You don't smoke? I shook my head. May I offer you a liqueur? This, too, I declined. I don't like alcohol. It makes me feel tired and dizzy, I said apologetically. Don't you have any bad habits? I shrugged. I have my weaknesses, but they are of a different nature. What are they? I'm very self-willed, and I often don't do what other people demand of me. I'm also very undiplomatic. How do you mean? I'm often tempted to say things people don't wish to hear. 
Mm. One couldn't tell from your appearance. You look rather gentle. After this exchange, we got down to talking about the theater, about dancing and future plans. How do you envisage your future? I am going to dance. And how and where do you want to dance? Uh, like Impakov, uh, like Impakoven, like Gert, like Vigman, in concert halls and on stages. Do you have a rich friend to finance you? Mm-hmm. I laughed. I don't need a rich friend. I'll succeed on my own. Smiling, he broke in. Dear little Fräulein Lenny Riefenstahl, that's your name, isn't it? You strike me as very naive. You need a rich friend. Otherwise, you'll never get anywhere. Never. Mm. Nothing changes. What's Would you care name? to bet? Yeah. Who's your daddy? Is mm-hmm. he rich like me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> would you care to bet on it? She said, yeah. Lenny says, yes, I would, he said, and tried to put his arms around me. Uh-huh. I pulled away, stood up, and walked quickly to the door. What a pity, I said. I was looking forward to chatting with you. He tried to hold me, but I hurried out. Before closing the door, I called back. I'll send you an invitation to my first recital. That's a promise. Goodbye. He got his invitation six months later. Nice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> go mm-hmm. Lenny. Yeah, go Lenny. Right. Yeah, I'm I'm rooting for her at, yeah, this, for sure. 100%. at this point. For sure. Um, this is where she deals with some injuries. Mm. Uh, so... I'm going to read it. It's important. She says, my dance training was training was severely disrupted when I broke bones in my feet. Uh, no fewer than three times. Yeah. The first time I slipped on uh, orange peel after ballet class. Ugh. Unable to stand, I was taken to hospital. My right ankle was, fr- was fractured, but I was able to dance again after only three weeks. My second accident occurred six months later. Walking home through the woods in the darkness, I stepped into a hole. This time I fractured my left ankle. The third accident was more serious. My bedroom floor had been painted the previous day, and in order to reach the hallway without touching the floor, I took a gigantic leap from the bed. The bed slid back. I lost my balance and came down lopsided. Now my metatarsal bone was broken, and I had to stop training for six weeks. I could still feel the pain years later. This is a bit about Einstein. During this time of enforced rest, I saw a film about Einstein and his theory of relativity. It was an important discovery for me. I don't think I am exaggerating when I say that the moment I began to understand this theory, many things changed for me, and I seemed to undergo an expansion of consciousness. For someone with my ideas, Einstein's concept of the relative was revolutionary. All right. And now we have a chapter about her first man. And this is pretty essential stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm getting through my my early life uh, fragments here. All right. And then we'll pick up the bio and keep on churning. Keep on chucking. Yeah. This is a fascinating life and a fascinating story. At the age of 21, I had my first experience with a man. Even though I wouldn't admit it to myself, my feelings for Otto Freudsheim were growing deeper until at times they were almost overpowering. <laughs> And yet I managed to avoid seeing him for two years. I could live with it only because I was completely fulfilled by my pansing, uh, passion for dancing. And th- that's the tennis star. Oh, okay. Okay. All my girlfriends were already having love affairs. Some were engaged with, and Alice, my best friend, had already married. I was the only one who was still sexually inexperienced. Eventually, I did feel that I was missing something, and I often toyed with the idea of having an adventure. But with whom? I had many quiet admirers, but didn't like any of them much. So almost against my will, my thoughts concentrated more and more on the man who I almost feared. My most Mm -hmm. ardent suitor was Gunther Rahn, a kind-hearted man who was friendly with Otto Freudsheim. Somehow I managed to tell Gunther about my secret fantasies, and although I realized that he would be very distressed, I also said that I thought of him as a very dear friend, but nothing more. Ah, friend-zoned! It was he who told me that Freudsheim had left Berlin and was living in Cologne, where he had become deputy police commissioner. I got to make sure that Otto Freudsheim is the the tennis guy. I might be mistaken. Let me just look it up. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, she's just friends. I got all these admirers. None of them are really up to stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's just like, I'm going to go and have an adventure. Yeah. Yeah. Film producers and magazine writers and... And theater guy, eh, no. Yeah, no, it is. 
it is yeah. the tennis player and now he's like the ch- the chief of police i think it's a different era where like being the yeah. top tennis guy doesn't guarantee you like you're gonna have to do other work but they'll just give you a cozy p- position as like the sure. chief of police because yeah. all the dudes respect you and mm. you just go and play tennis with the boys and <laughs> y- y- yeah yeah that doesn't yeah, sound yeah. too bad nah, take that job. yeah why not um all right he still kept his apartment in berlin however and according to gunther visited the capital every two weeks wonder what's he what he's doing hmm. spending time between two towns hmm. mm-hmm. i began to nag poor gunther to arrange a date for me in Freudsheim, perhaps an invitation to tea or something similar it was not so easy since meeting was possibly possible only at weekends when papa was off hunting i was still a carefully sheltered girl mm-hmm. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Dad Anyone. knows what he's got on his hands for yeah. sure. Yeah. There was great excitement when Gunther told me several weeks later that Otto Freudsheim would be expecting me at his apartment. Only now did I become fully aware of how reckless my plans my plan was. Yeah. Oof. There yeah. was no going back, but I was very apprehensive about what was to come. Alice was experienced in matters of love, so I shared my secret with her and asked her for advice. This is the advice yeah. she gets. The most important thing, she said, is to wear beautiful lingerie. You can't go in your woolen underwear. I'll lend you my set of silk undies. <laughs> okay. Okay. We, yeah. We're getting down. We're going to All Bone right. Town. We're going to the Bone Yard. <laughs> we're not messing around here. In your friend's underwear. Yeah. So okay. We're having, yep, having a normal Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Different times. Huh? Different times. Different times, yeah. yeah. Punctually at five in the afternoon, I stood in front of the house, an old and elegant patrician mansion on Rauchstrasse. Inside, a broad marble staircase, luxuriously carpeted, led to the front first floor. Slowly, very slowly, I climbed the steps as if going to to my execution. I rang the bell. Then the man, whom I didn't even know and whom I had been dreaming about for two years, stood in the doorway. Since the light was behind him, I couldn't see his face clearly, but he held out his hand and his deep, gentle voice made me shiver. Please come in, Fräulein Lenny, if I may call you that. I am delighted to make your acquaintance. Then he helped me out of my black velvet coat, trimmed, alas, with fake ermine. After arranging my hair, I stepped into a living room, softly lit to suggest intimacy, I thought. I sat down in a comfortable armchair while he poured me a cup of tea. A faltering conversation developed, small talk about tennis, dancing, and various trivia. I grew more and more embarrassed. Gunther had told me that Freudsheim was 18 years my senior. At 39, he was already an elderly man. Oof. Oh, oh. shots fired. Lenny. Oh. I don't know how oh. I feel about Lenny anymore. Gonna barf. <laughs> uh, oh, she goes on here. At 39, he was already an elderly man, according to the notions of the day. Oh, okay. The longer he gazed at me, the more nervous I became, especially when his gaze rested on my legs. By now, I just, just wanted to run home, but he put a, rec- a record on the mm-hmm. gramophone, a tango. Unresisting, I let him draw me out of the chair, and as if hypnotized, I danced several steps with him, nestling happily against him. My dreams and yearnings were coming true. Then, as he lifted me bodily up in his arms and gently placed me on a couch, my happiness abruptly fled. All I could feel was fear, a terror of the unknown. As he virtually ripped the clothes from my body and with almost brutal violence, tried to possess me quickly and totally. The experience was traumatic. Was this love? I felt nothing but pain and disappointment. How far it was from my dreams and hopes. All I had wanted was tenderness, just to be with him, to cuddle with him, and to lie at his feet. I endured it to the end, then covered my tearful face with a pillow. A short while later, he tossed me a towel and pointed to the bathroom. You can wash in there. Profoundly ashamed and humiliated... I walked into the bathroom where I wept bitter tears. For the first time in my life, feelings of hatred rose in me. Yeah. When I came back to the living room, he was already dressed. Glancing at his watch, he said with insulting indifference, I have an appointment. Then, incredibly, he pressed a banknote into my hand. 20 American dollars, a fortune at the time. If you get pregnant, you can use this to get rid of it. I Jeez. tore up the banknote and threw the pieces at his feet. You are a monster, I shouted yeah. and ran from the apartment, filled with rage and despair. 
my God. Mm. What a D-bag. He's, she's throwing herself at him. And he, you know, just be be normal, dude. Jesus. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. She writes him a letter uh, at some point here. And I want to make sure I get it because it's so interesting. In Dresden, so she goes to Dresden, uh, the memory of Frotzheim was sublimated into some of my later dances. Uh, and she goes on and talks about them. Mm-hmm. She did a cycle called, got to come to my dance cycle, dude. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's, dude, it's the ninth. <laughs> or whatever. Oh, groovy. 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 Yeah. yeah. The three dances of Eros. I called the first one Fire, a passionate dance to music by Tchaikovsky. And the second one, Surrender. I chose Chopin and I used a piece by Grieg for the third dance release, which was inspired by Gothic sculpture. So she's doing modern, like interpretive yeah. dance. Huh. Yeah. She wouldn't dance on points, but she, yeah. Um, One day, to my astonishment, I found exquisite flowers in my room and a card which said, forgive me, I love you, I have to see you again, your Otto. I had never expected an answer to my desperate letter, and I never wanted to see that man again. Yeah, I want to make sure I get the bit about the letter. Yeah, so that very night, she says, I wrote a letter to Freudstein telling him about the love I once had for him and my boundless repugnance now. Mm. So he comes back with flowers and everything, which is just like, this is just shocking stuff. Scandalous. Yeah. Yeah. Now, but this is very interesting. I had never expected an answer and I never wanted to see him again. Yet now he was sending flowers. Why didn't I hurl them from the window? Why did I clutch them in my arms? Why did I kiss the card? I locked myself in my room and wept, wept wept. Several days later, he appeared in person. I had felt all along that I would not have the strength to resist his insolence, and in some mysterious way, I was a slave to him. He ran his hand over my hair. I was shaken by your letter, he told me. Can you forgive me? I didn't realize how wonderful you are. He remained all day and all night, and I found him much changed. He had become more tender. Again, I was hypnotized by his eyes, and even more by his voice, yet physically I could feel nothing for him. He came back two weeks later, then a third time, treating me as if I had become his property, while I could only think only of escaping from this bondage. Jeez. What yeah. a story. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. God. Right. What a piece of work that guy was. Absolutely. Absolutely. But also it's just like how casually she's like, yeah, it was my, my first love affair was rapey with the best tennis player in the country right right i mean right. it's 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 very dfw in a way mm, yeah <laughs> yeah yeah wild all right um, but it is you're right this thing about her she's captivating to men clearly um of all right of all stripes right and she can also be hypnotized mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right i mean the yeah. first time she encountered this guy he just stared, stared at, her. at her yeah, yeah. He's probably two got years, two years later. She's like, I'm, I'm, right, you know, right, right, yeah. right. He probably has like the cliff notes or the cheat notes for like mesmer somewhere right. in the background. Right. Oh, <laughs> right. this is how I'm going to, mm-hmm. is the PUA for the early 20th century. <laughs> Just find her in the locker room and stare at her, bro. <laughs> That's how you pull. Yeah. This is how you're going to get out of it, man. You're going to stare creepily at a hundred women. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. 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 The Frotzheim system. Uh, it's a long acronym. Um, so this is called my first dance recital, and this is going to pay off what mm-hmm. we've just gone through with, with mm-hmm. dear Lenny. Mm-hmm. I was training harder than ever for several hours a day. At night, I fell into bed exhausted, and it was difficult getting up the next morning. My darling mother spoiled me terribly, even putting my shoes and stockings on me in bed. Then came the day I had to prove myself. 23rd of October, 1923. I stood on the stage of Munich's Tonhalle, waiting for the music to begin. At that time, inflation was at such height that Harry Sokol, oh, Harry Sokol is a fellow who was obsessed with her, adored Mm. her. He was a Jewish uh, financier. He Mm. financed her dancing, and then he would go on and produce very, very many films. Um, With her. But it just that, 
Yeah, yeah, with with her yeah. in in them, but also just like generally. But he yeah. he also like later she moves somewhere, like into a flat somewhere, and like he gets the flat across the hall without kind of telling her, right? Like he Ew. just moves in next door. So yeah. he's obsessed. He's obsessed with her too. Yeah. Um, at the time, inflation was at such a height that Harry Sokol had to shell out only one U.S. dollar to pay for the hall and the necessary publicity. My first recital, financed by my father, was to take place four out days later in Berlin, but Sokol felt that I should have some previous experience and had arranged for me to have a kind of dress rehearsal here. The room was barely one-third full, for of course I was unknown, and the few spectators had probably obtained free uh, passes from the manager's office. <laughs> the emptiness of the room didn't bother me. However, I was simply happy to be dancing in front of an audience, and I could hardly wait to get on stage. My very first dance, study after a gavotte, was applauded enthusiastically, and I had to encore the third. The clapping became louder and louder until during my final dances, the audience demanded repeated encores. I danced on until I was too exhausted to continue. Die Münchner Neusten Nachrichten said, This is a marvelously gifted dancer. Her artist artistry is utterly authentic and original. For instance, in Vals Caprice, and in the delightful final dance in which she had all the grace of a swaying poppy, a bending cornflower. And then I stood on stage in Berlin, once again at Blutner Hall. The place was almost sold out. Friends had made sure of that. This time I had to prove to my father that there was no other future for me. I had to convince him, conquer him, triumph over him once and for all. I was dancing purely for him, and I gave it my all. At the end of the recital, a wave of applause came crashing towards me, and as I curtsied, I felt my father's eyes upon me. Had he forgiven me? That night, I won my first great victory. Not only had my father forgiven me, he was deeply moved. Kissing mm -hmm. me, he said, now I believe you. Oh. That was my finest reward. The evening was more than a success. It was a triumph beyond my wildest dreams. The next day, I sat in a pastry shop on Kurf, oh, Kurfürstendamm. That's a tough one. Yeah, I think you nailed it. Yeah, nailed it. Um, <laughs> there's an umlaut in there, too. <laughs> Reading the headline, A New Dancer. At first, it didn't even cross my mind that this referred to me. Then I noticed that the review was about my performance and that it was a hymn of praise to be repeated in every Berlin newspaper. John Schakowsky, the most knowledgeable and most feared dance critic in Berlin, wrote in Der Vorwarts, it was a revelation, an almost total realization of the heights of artistry which could be achieved in the realm of dance. Fräulein Riefenstahl came very close to the goal towards which her most famous colleagues have striven in vain. The fulfillment of our hopes for dance in the future, that new spirit and supreme style. Fred Hildenbrandt wrote in the Berliner Tageblatt, when one sees this girl move to the music, one has an awareness that here is a dancer who will appear perhaps once in a thousand years, an wow. artiste of consummate grace and unparalleled beauty. Wow. Okay. I was not expecting her to be like a generational dancer. I, this is wow. Yeah. Huh. Cool. Oh, neither was I when I was yeah. getting into it. And yeah. I'll, I will tell you, I'll skip ahead and, and, and here briefly uh, and go on a, a slight tangent. When you watch The Wonderful, Horrible Life of Lenny Riefenstahl, they show her screening on a little um, on a little screen the original, like the footage of, I'm pretty sure Triumph of the Will. It might be either Triumph or, or Olympia, but... Maybe I think it's Triumph of the Will, and she's watching it, and her comments are all like, "You see how it's like a dance? Mm. You see? So this is this is the er, this is the language that underpins her cinematic technique and style. She understands the body. She understands yeah. how the body moves. This yeah. is the grammar that she brought into cinema. This dance like understanding of motion, and it carries throughout her yeah. throughout her work. Yeah, fascinating. Very important to understand. <laughs> um. Overnight, my life veered off in an entirely new direction. I received offers from all sides and inexperienced as I was. I accepted everything without an <laughs> impresario's help, yeah. regardless of whether it made sense or not. It's so sweet, sweet and endearing. Like, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I'll, do I'll do that. I'll do yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she needed One of the an agent or mm -hmm. a manager or something. Sure, big time. One of the first people to engage me was Max Reinhardt. 
I did six evening performances at his Deutsches Theater and several matinees at his Kammerspiele. I had no idea how Max Reinhardt came to notice me so soon. Only later did I learn I owed this to Dr. Vollmuller, with whom I had wagered that I would achieve my goal without a rich friend. I hadn't mm-hmm. forgotten that and sent him two tickets for the Blutner Hall, but heard nothing more from him. As he subsequently told me, he had taken Reinhardt along to my opening night, and Reinhardt had been so enthusiastic that he engaged me for his Deutsches Theater. This was the first time that a dancer had appeared as a sole performer at the most famous theater in Germany. Wow. This is what we're dealing with. She does, yeah. and I don't. I, I've I've had friends who are very very serious in the dance world, and I've in the theater world here in Minneapolis is a huge famously huge center for dance. Mm. Uh, and this style of dance is something that it's modern dance. Mm-hmm. So she's doing these expressive interpretive things with ballet training. And I assume some other forms of sort of dance training. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is like innovative and new uh, right. and a very, very big deal. Clearly. Yeah, and it's just, it, it's distilled into its own art form. This isn't dancing as part of a a song and dance show or something. This is like, yeah, she's... dance, dance as the art. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. very cool. Yeah, yep. And if you if you've never been to like modern dance, like it's funny. Like modern dance has like an almost like weird sound for mm-hmm. somebody who's maybe a theater. I don't know, man. Mm-hmm. Ugh, <laughs> modern dance, really. Mm-hmm. Go, go mm-hmm. see some. You'll be you'll be shocked. It's, yeah, it's I can't a pretty say incredible I've ever, experience. I can't say I've ever seen any. Uh, to oh, be really? Honest. And uh, well, part, not as its own thing, right? Elements of it, you know, sneaking in. Like, for instance, saw Kanye West during the My Beautiful. You and I saw him during the My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy, and he had all of those dancers out, and it was a very evocative. Uh, it was really something to see, but only I've only seen it sort of and. Uh, auxiliary to something else so i mean the closest that most people will probably get now is that famous episode of sunny where mac yeah. comes out and dances his coming out <laughs> and right. which that, is hilarious yeah. Yeah. but that's yeah. that's kind of it i mean it's not just that right sure. there's there's more styles another another thing is if you're ever traveling mm-hmm. uh and you maybe are somewhere where you don't know the language so you're like mm, i don't know if i want to go see a play mm-hmm. uh the opera might have subtitles or whatever dance mm-hmm. You yeah. can go see dance anywhere. Yeah. Anywhere. Yeah. And the language is universal. So right. yeah, right. something to think about. Something to think about. Uh, here's Lenny. Next, I received numerous offers from agencies. I danced in a different city almost every evening. Frankfurt, Leipzig, Dusseldorf, Cologne, Dresden, Kiel, and Stetten. And everywhere I experienced the same success with the public and the press. Rock, she's a rock star. Yeah, that's my mother. She's like suddenly a rock star. It's wild. Mm -hmm. My mother accompanied me on all these trips. After just a few months, I also received offers from abroad. Before the year ended, I had danced at Zurich's Schauspielhaus, at Innsbruck's Municipal Theater, and at Prague's Central Concert Hall. It was intoxicating. Even in Zurich, among the restrained Swiss, I do an encore my first dance, a Caucasian march by Ippolitov. That hadn't happened in any other city. And in Prague, I had to break off Oriental Fairy Tale and start again three times because the audience applauded my very first movement so enthusiastically that I couldn't hear the music. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Oh, go Lenny. This is, that's great. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I like and hearing about up. people winning. Uh, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Big fat dub. Yeah. She liked to dance most to Schubert's unfinished symphony uh she says the physical physical strain was brutal she oh every was night exhausted. yeah your whole body into this thing i can only imagine right and she said that sometimes some uh at some of the recitals or performances her encores increased the number of dances to like 14 right and and this is a time i'm sure you don't have now you would probably have something like a like a sports medicine therapist afterward ice you and stretch you and you know make sure you get, and this it was you know all right done for the night move on right. to dusseldorf absolutely totally yeah. right she'd have a whole team built up mm-hmm. around her from like day one mm-hmm. and like a contract and a deal yeah. and a, watching yeah. her diet and watching you know right. making sure she had right. a rest and everything right. yeah yeah so let me see here let me uh let me don't stop let me take a bathroom break i will be back oh in yeah just one minute okay yeah no worries uh 
Hope everybody's enjoying this episode of Art of Darkness about Lenny Riefenstahl. We will get to the uh, the National Socialist Party. It is coming. It's coming in hot. Uh, I just I feel so motivated to share this story of her her early life and these early successes, which are so formative for her. Uh, she goes on to say here she received uh, received film offers, but she did, didn't even consider them at this point. She wanted to dance. Uh, and so she did. Uh, yeah. No, let's let's share the incident of uh, poor Harry Sokol. So she had two guest appearances scheduled at Zurich's Schauspielhaus. And she writes, where I was to alternate with Tolstoy's play The Living Corpse, starring Alexander Moisey, a marvelous actor with whom I quickly became friends. After spending an evening with him, I returned to the hotel quite late. I had already undressed when I heard a knock at the door. It was Sokol asking to come in. I refused. I'm tired, I said, and I don't want to let a man into my room so late at night. Come into my room then. I won't do anything. I just want to be with you. I almost pitied him and tried to calm him down. Be reasonable, Harry. I can't come to you. I would never be able to make you happy. He wept, shouted, threatened to shoot himself, and said so many dreadful things that I became quite afraid threw my clothes on, left my room, and hurried downstairs to Hertha. Brad's back. Harry Sokol is knocking on her door in Zurich, and when she doesn't want to come to his room or have him in her room, he threatens to shoot himself. Oh, my God. Um, yeah. So she's with her friend now. We didn't dare leave her room until the next afternoon, when, to our great relief, we learned that Sokol had left town. The concierge handed me a letter in which Sokol apologized for his conduct. He did not wish to lose my friendship, and he promised never to harass me like that again. He wrote that he only wanted to make me happy, which was why he had arranged my dance recitals in Paris and London. That was a shock. I had no idea that he had organized and probably also financed the offers from Paris and London. Oh. Profoundly disappointed, I dropped the letter. No other dancer had performed solo in Paris after World War I. I had been so proud, so ecstatic to receive those invitations, and now this disappointment. When I picked up the letter and read it to the end, I lost all desire to dance in Paris and London. Sokol continued, Since you don't have the proper clothes to appear in these big cities, I have ordered a suitable wardrobe to be sent to your hotel room. You can take whatever you like. At that moment, my doorbell rang and a messenger brought in two armfuls of fur coats. Hertha signed, for the, signed the receipt for two mink coats and ermine and a sp sporty leopard coat trimmed with black leather. They were all beautiful, but I was not tempted, for the whole thing felt like a slap in the face. It would have been wonderful dancing in Paris and London and owning such furs, but what would it cost me? I would have had to pretend to love, pretend love, put on an act. I could not, and I would not. Hertha, I said impulsively. Let's take the train back to Berlin. I wrote a few comforting lines of farewell to Sokol, asking him to try and understand, and then Hertha and I fled from the hotel. In the train compartment, I hugged Hertha saying, you can't imagine how happy I feel after my decision. Now I am free again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so here now we're getting to the incidents of her, her uh, injury. And this is, this is what stopped her dancing career. So mm -hmm. my next recital took place in Prague at a theater that could hold 3000 spectators. Lenny on stage, 3000 people, Prague. Okay. Art of On Darkness live, June what? Yeah, 5th? <laughs> yeah June fifth, St. Paul, Minnesota. We're trying to pack in twenty to thirty people. You guys are gonna, everybody's gonna have a great time. Walden Brew, uh, Brewery is incredible. Eventually, we'll play Royal Albert Hall. It's a yeah. matter of time, Brad. Yeah, it's yeah. a matter of time. Mm. Mm -hmm. Anna Pavlova was the only other dancer who had ever performed here, and tonight the house was sold out down to the last seat. My evening was a triumph, but perhaps my last. While making one of my leaps, I felt a crack in my knee. Oof. The pain was so sharp that I could barely finish the dance. Now she goes through a um, like a litany of doctors. Yeah. Nobody gave her an X-ray, even though like the X-ray had been invented thirty years earlier. Yeah. Eventually, she would get um, surgery done. And she had like a like a piece of cartilage had like grown to the size of a walnut oh and ha had that removed. She's saying during that miserable period when I could walk only with the help of a stick, Otto Frotzheim looked after me. 
Although before the accident, my tours had allowed me to meet him only rarely, he insisted that we become officially engaged. He had wow. introduced me to his mother, who lived in Weiss, Wiesbaden, and had begun preparing uh, for our wedding. I agreed to everything, for he still had great power over me, and I couldn't contradict him face to face. But I was secretly determined not to marry him. I knew we could only be happy, uh, unhappy. Man, is All there, right. hmm, just thinking about this guy, her father you know i think mean, there's something there's some coming calling attractions back to Freud. yeah mm, yeah mm. Mm -hmm. sure uh this is where she is on a subway platform on a cane it's after the vitzentide tennis tournament where frotzheim her uh i guess now fiance wins the tournament as mm -hmm. you do mm -hmm. just like super giga elite power couple <laughs> right right chad and stacy stacy's unhappy <laughs> stacy's yeah. like the most famous new dancer in europe mm -hmm. uh and she is on a subway platform and yeah for I, I think for americans too i don't think like americans fully grok how urbane europe was at this time relative to mm -hmm. the united states like it, at that time it was more urbane than america is now mm -hmm. like it's just mm -hmm. city after city they have subways they have trains they have like mm -hmm. modernity is in full swing right in europe right now yeah. and you know in america it's a different vibe yeah. uh she sees a poster for something called the mountain of destiny or just mountain of destiny. Mm -hmm. And there was a genre of film in Germany at the time, uh, that this, this fellow named Dr. Arnold Funk, I think pioneered. Okay. And they were called mountain films. Oh, and they okay. would be, yeah. And they would be filmed on location. Like I think Dr. This Dr. Funk fellow was the first person to like film, something like entirely outdoors or like entirely on location, like with cool. no interiors anywhere else, no studio. Um, I would watch, I would watch some of that. That seems interesting. Yeah. It's yeah. very, very interesting stuff. And so she, she goes to the cinema and she becomes totally obsessed with mountain of destiny and with these mountains. And to the point where she go there in the Dolomites, she like, weeks later travels there hoping to meet them right huh so she, hoping to so meet she, the filmmakers yeah hoping to meet the filmmakers yeah and cool. there's a fellow named um louis trinker and she goes uh you know down there and spends like four weeks down by the mountain where they shot it and then then it says she writes then on the day of my departure i met someone at the hotel it was a meeting that I had greatly hoped for. In the lobby, I had come upon. That's the other thing about this this time and age. Like it's you can't find somebody on social media. Of mm. course not. You can't no. get a phone book. There's no phone book for like, ah, oh, where am I gonna, you know, you'd have to mm. like send a card to the production office and then hear back. So like somebody in Lenny's position who's kind of footloose has a bit of money, mm -hmm. just like, ah, I'm going down there. Yeah, I'll just go there and run it's into gonna, him. Yeah. Like a, a, can you imagine actually living in the material world? <laughs> right oh. you, you gotta go track somebody down <laughs> right yeah can you imagine like going to a library because that's where you're gonna get the book incredible right. wow yeah mm -hmm. anyway um so in the lobby i had come across upon a poster announcing that the motion picture mountain of destiny would be shown that evening at the hotel and that the leading actor louis trenker would be present at the screening after dinner i nervously watched the film though i knew almost every sequence of image images by heart Nevertheless, the effect on me was as powerful as it had been in Berlin. As soon as it had ended and the lights had gone up, I hobbled back to where the projector was set up and found, standing next to it, a man whom I recognized as a star of the movie. Are you Herr Trinker? I asked somewhat diffidently. His eyes slid over my elegant clothes. Then he nodded and said, yes, I am. My embarrassment evaporated. My enthusiasm for the film, the mountains, and the performance simply bubbled out of me. I'm going to be in your next picture. I said uh, self-confidently, as if there, this were the most obvious thing in the world. Trinker eyed me in astonishment and began to laugh. Can you mountain climb? An elegant little lady like you shouldn't be traipsing around mountains. I'll learn how. I will definitely learn how. I can do it if I make up my mind to. Again, I felt a sharp pain in my knee. 
An ironic smile flitted across Trinker's face. Gesturing goodbye, he turned away. I called after him. Where can I write to you? Trinker, Balzano, that's enough. So she goes back to Berlin. She writes a letter. And she's back in Berlin. And she she recognizes Dr. Funk, the director, at, a, at, like, a, at like a coffee shop. Mm. It's like a pastry shop. Mm. Um, oh, oh, wait, no, it's not, it's not a, a, a chance meeting. They, they agree to meet in any case, they, she's going to meet him. So she meets him and she says, excuse me, are you Dr. Funk? Uh, are you for Rose, uh, Riefenstahl? We sat down. I opened the conversation. She says, at first I was inhibited by his timidity, but little by little, I grew live, lively or almost rapturous. Dr. Funk sat opposite me, mute, his eyes almost constantly lowered to his coffee cup. He asked me only one question. What kind of work did I do? Trenker had obviously not sent him my letter and my photographs. Dr. Funk knew nothing whatever about me, but hesitantly he began to talk. He was supposed to do a picture for Ufa, but had no subject as yet. Ufa is like the the state, the big like studio in mm -hmm. Deutschland. I think it was eventually like Nazified. I mean, sure. the Nazis took it over. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't dare ask him for a part. I simply told him that I would love to be involved in his next film, if only as a spectator. Now, what happens is she goes and she has uh, her surgery. And uh, hang on, I got to turn the heat down in our house. I'm getting all so I'm getting all all jacked up talking about <laughs> Lenny Riefenstahl and her her burgeoning film career that's about to start here. Yeah. It's be, now, it's is this stuff. It, 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 maybe this is a silly question? Maybe we can't answer it. Is her wanting to meet this Funk guy, Arnold Funk? Is this more like going to meet Michael Bay or going to meet uh, Christopher uh, Nolan? Neither. Neither, Neither. Okay. Funk Funk was. Um, let me let me find you a little bit about him because I think it'll be helpful to yeah. uh, to give you some context. He was super. It might be more like meeting Ari Aster a few oh, okay. years ago. Yeah, yeah. Because okay, so uh, he was a German film director and pioneer of the mountain film genre. He is best known for the extraordinary alpine footage he captured in such films as The Holy Mountain, The White Hell of Pitts Palou, Storm Over Mont Blanc, The White Ecstasy, and SOS Iceberg. And he, yeah, he was instrumental in launching the careers of several film marker, makers during the Weimar years in Germany, including uh, Lenny Riefenstahl. Right. My understanding of this is that he, he had like, he had some difficulty getting his films made and distributed okay. like initially and they weren't it, it was because people people thought because these films are often like very plot thin mm. right the, like the early films it was more right. just about like showing them out they were like yeah. proto the kind of documentaries but yeah. eventually he flips the script i actually think it's going to be it's going to be talked about here okay um so she's laid up uh getting getting this surgery and she writes the third day after my operation when the nurse announced that i had a visitor i was incredulous for no one knew where i was and who should it be but dr funk he looked pale and exhausted and as the nurse left us he said i brought you something i spent the last three nights writing it for you again the lenny effect and he handed me a bundle wrapped in paper. I unpacked it slowly. Inside was a manuscript. And on the first page, I read The Holy Mountain, written for the dancer Lenny Riefenstahl. Uh -oh. I cannot put into words my feelings at that, that moment. I laughed and wept with delight. How is it possible, I wondered, that a wish could come true so quickly, a wish that I had never even uttered? Hmm. And it goes on. I had to stay in bed for three months, three endless months, not knowing whether I would be able to move my leg as before. And during this time, Dr. Funk went through the ent entire film with me, scene by scene. <laughs> His faith was con and confidence were unshakable, as if there was no doubt that the operation would be a success. In the 13th week, I was finally allowed to stand up. The physician and the nurse hovered near to help me take my first steps. And I was in luck. I could bend and move my knee without pain. Hmm. So, very good. Yeah. And... Uh, this is where the business with auto changes. 
A change occurred in my private life too. I learned from tennis friends that Otto Freudsheim, my fiance, was having an affair with a tennis colleague. Unbelievable. Can you believe this Otto guy? <laughs> they had shared a room for a whole week. Ugh. Painful in a way uh, as this news was, I saw it as a stroke of providence. I could finally Who's, break who off. Who steps out on Lenny Riefenstahl? Who's Lenny Riefenstahl's had surgery. She's laid up for three months. He can't keep it in your pants. Right. Right. Yeah. She's the catch of the she's the catch of the decade. Yeah. Anyway, I'm going to say match point. <laughs> Lenny. Ridiculous. Otto. Don't like that guy. <laughs> no, that was my name in German class. I called with Otto. Otto. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. It's fate. Not all autos. No, not That's all. What I gotta autos. Say. Hashtag. <laughs> yeah. So. But this is good for her because she says, I could finally break off all connection with that mm. man. A decision for which I had previously been unable to muster enough courage. Yet I still suffered at the thought of the final parting. Mm. Freitzheim wouldn't hear of it. Surprise. He kept sending me letters and flowers daily. And one day he stood outside my door asking if he could come in. I knew that if I let him enter, I would be at his mercy again. But I still found it hard not to open the door to him. He must have heard my sobs for he did not go away. He kept knocking and begging me in his gentle, seductive voice, Lenny, let me in, Lenny, Lenny. I did not yield, however, although it was the most painful decision I had ever made. After his footsteps faded, I wept all night. Hmm. All right. So now she's here with uh, Trinker and Funk, and they are going to go and shoot uh, the Holy Mountain. Hmm. And I'm coming to the end of my notes here that I have about the early life. And uh, here's another incident that happens that's mm -hmm. quite funny. Uh, let's see. I want to make sure. Is it some other dude pounding on her door in the middle no, of the night? No, it, it kind of is. <laughs> it kind of is. I want to make sure I get it right. Uh, this is very interesting. All right. So they're down... Uh, by these mountains getting ready to to shoot uh the holy mountain and it was already past midnight when funk opened a bottle of champagne and we pledged our friendship and drank to the success of our film then when funk stepped out for a few moments trinker hugged and kissed me Mad boy. it may have been the champagne the delightful prospect of our future work they're having a showman's or yeah. just the atmosphere of goodwill but all i knew is that this was the first time i had ever lay in a man's arms under the spell of happiness I had never known before. Mm -hmm. When Funk returned and saw us embracing, he looked thunderstruck and his face was ashen as I pulled away from Trinker. What worried me most was that this incident might endanger our project. Would this destroy my dream of playing in the Holy Mountain? There was an instant of, uh, of tension and Trinker stood up and said, it's late. I'll see Lenny back to her to hotel. No, I'll take Lenny back uh, to the hotel, said Frank Funk. Trenker, happy to withdraw, murmured as he shook my hand. I'll stop by to see you in the morning before I head back to Bolzano. I would have given anything to leave with him, but I felt too sorry for Funk. No sooner were we alone than he collapsed, sobbing and burying his face in his hands. From his incoherent, almost intelligible words, I learned how deeply he cared for me how much he had hoped and dreamed about me and how terribly wounded he had been by seeing us embrace. I tried to comfort him when he, when he caressed my hand saying you, my diatima, which was the name of my role in the Holy mountain. Get it together, man. Get yes. a grip. Seriously. <laughs> Eventually he stood up, handed me my coat and said, I'll take you back to your hotel. You've got to rest. Forgive me. Silently, we walked through the streets in the cold night air until Fonk halted abruptly at a small bridge and, with a low cry, ran down the slope toward the river, apparently to jump in. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> guys are just constantly like, if I can't <sighs> have you, I'll die. We need a Lenny containment unit. Yeah, We've got, We've got to like, shut down the dance, the, the showbiz industry until we figure out what the hell is going what on. What the hell to do with Lenny Reefenstahl? <laughs> what is the half life of exposure to Lenny Reefenstahl? <laughs> what a Chad. What a Stacy. Anyway, uh, 
Yeah, I threw my arms around him, desperately trying to hold him back while I shouted for help, but Fonk was already up to his hips in water, and I wasn't strong enough to pull him out. Then I heard footsteps and voices. Some men came running and handed, uh, hauled Fonk out of the water. He was shaking with cold, but offered no resistance. We took him in a taxi to the Freiburg Hospital. He was feverish and delirious, but they allowed me to stay with him until he fell asleep. Had to have been drunk. Yeah, Dejected probably. and unspeakably sad, I went to my hotel. What would happen now? What was I to do? The film couldn't possibly be made. There were no answers to any of my questions, and the situation gnawed at me through the few hours until dawn. In the morning, there was a knock at my door. When I opened it, Trenker stood there, and I let him in. For a moment, we exchanged embarrassed looks. Then he hugged me, and I began to sob as I told him what I had gone through with Funk. He's crazy, Trink said. Trenker said angrily. <laughs> He'll come round. I know him. He went mad once before while we were shooting Mountain of Destiny. <laughs> I love this idea of this like geologist film director who's he makes the mountain movies. Right. I fall in love with the women and yeah. I go crazy. I, I go throw crazy. myself into the into the river. But uh, the actor's like, that's just yeah, the director. That's what he does. Yeah. We yeah. need we truly do need more energy like this back in the world. There's not, a, there isn't enough. There's of it, none right. of this anymore. Yeah. It's all been taken over by bean counters and professionalism. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yeah, we need this kind of reckless passion, obviously mm -hmm. without harming one another. You got to try yeah. to avoid that. But like, yeah, 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 yeah. So anyway, uh, then, <laughs> then like the door flies open and Funk enters the room. This is like a, a French play now. Raving like a madman, he jumped on Trinker, who being a stronger man, grabbed and held him. But Funk was beyond control. He tore loose in a Brutal fist fight began, growing oh more God. and more violent. I tried to pull them apart, but it was no use. I ran to the window, opened it, and climbed onto the windowsill as if I were going to jump. My ploy worked. The men stopped fighting. Trinker lifted me down into his arms, and Funk stormed out of the room. Oh, my God. Yeah. And, like, uh, it goes on anyway. She gets <laughs> letters, flowers and letters. Mm -hmm. And it's like, we're still going to make this movie. Of course. And they're going to shoot it in Switzerland. And they start to teach her how to ski. And then things like, I think it's on this film that things really go like, it might be this or a later film. Yeah, there's a different film. But it's almost like a comedy of errors. Like one actor breaks a leg. The other actor breaks like because they're all skiing, right? You can imagine mm. these movies. It's just mm. like these movies would have been like the IMAX of their day, right? You right. can imagine you're in Berlin. You can't afford to go to Switzerland, but I want to see the mountains, you know, and mm. you and you you show up and it's just this huge cinema and they're swooping and climbing yeah. and there's yeah. expressive music and light and the light cool. through the clouds. And yeah, yeah. It's yeah, very cool fun. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I looked okay. up uh, Lewis Trinker and an image and Arnold Fonk just to see, you know, what's the competition here? Uh, yeah. Lewis Trinker is much, much more handsome man. <laughs> you can well, it's the actor versus yeah, the, the director. Versus the director. I, yeah, I don't no competition. No competition. Yeah. All right, we're into our well into our third hour on this episode. Mm -hmm. I think we're gonna have at least three more to go. Mm -hmm. So buckle up, Brad. Get ready for it. Buckle up, everybody. Brad, can you? Will I go and uh, take care of some business real yeah. quick? Will you tell people about tell people about the Patreon? Tell people about the book club. Tell people about Tarkovsky. Tarkovsky. And, oh yeah, and the other stuff we have coming because this we're doing we're doing a great film director from frankly the the Third Reich, mm -hmm. and we're doing a great film director from the soviet union yeah yeah pretty much back to back yeah yeah um yeah so uh yeah patreon.com slash art of dark pod um join in for five dollars a month and you get access to the after dark episode which is a approximately 30 minute uh bonus episode attached to each episode that's both these core episodes like we're doing right now and the dark room episodes which we have a number of them that's when we have a guest on to kind of dig a little deeper into a, a, a certain aspect of of one of the subjects we've already covered um uh, you will also get access to bookends our reading club we meet uh, about once every month or six weeks uh, to discuss uh, either a a classic must read uh, work or uh, such as heart of darkness 
Um, and uh, what did we do most recently? Oh, uh, Borges's uh, Ficciones or a work of contemporary literature by a, you know, a, a writer who's still around, um, as in Dan Baltic's Nutcranker and coming up soon, Aaron Gwynn's uh, All God's Children. These meetings you read, we read, we hang out, uh, we record it. If you can't make it, but you're still a Patreon subscriber, you can listen to the recording. Um, and you can also always chat with us on the Telegram channel, t.me slash Art of Dark Pod. Uh, what else we've got going on? Oh, yes. Coming up soon. We are doing uh, basically a week from today. We're going to be covering the great uh, Russian filmmaker Andrei Tarkovsky. I think we're going to see some similarities to this story a little bit, but also a very different kind of figure um, a filmmaker who's thought to be almost too esoteric by many people, um, a true sort of idealist uh, artist. Um, and I, I think we're going to we're going to have an interesting episode because by the end of it, um, if you don't get Tarkovsky, I intend to help you understand how to watch a Tarkovsky film. So stay tuned for that. Wow, I really need that because yeah. I've never been able to get my claws into Tarkovsky. It took me a minute, <laughs> but I've cracked the Tarkovsky code, I think. Ah, so. <clears throat> very good. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brad, for covering. Well, I of handled course. a little bit of business there in the background yeah, yeah. and we're out of the early life. Okay. We are into the career. And I'm going to go back in the Wikipedia and just bring us up and to the point where we're going to meet the, Austri the Austrian corporal. Ah, okay. Okay. All right. So as we've covered, Riefenstahl attended dancing academies and became well-known for her self-styled interpretive dancing skills, traveling across Europe with Max Reinhardt in a show funded by Jewish producer Harry Sokol. Mm -hmm. Riefenstahl often made almost 700 Reichsmarks for each performance and was so dedicated to dancing that she gave filmmaking no thought. She mm -hmm. began to suffer a series of foot injuries that led to a knee surgery that threatened her dancing career. It was while going to a doctor's appointment that she first saw a poster for the 1924 film Mountain of Destiny. She became inspired to go into movie making and began visiting the cinema to see films and also attend film shows. Uh, on one of her adventures, I, I like that, man. You got to have a life where, like, when they're writing your biography, when they're writing your Wikipedia, mm -hmm. you better damned well be sure that they can start a para with on one of his adventures. <laughs> right. <laughs> we need to return to adventure. Return I'm quite to adventure. Yeah. Don't yeah. outsource this stuff to, to Twitter or to right. other corners of the internet. Mm -hmm. Go, go yeah. to the show. Mm -hmm. Go take the trip. Mm -hmm. All right. She uh, on this adventure, she met Louis Trenker, the actor, uh, Mountain of Destiny. Then they met. She she meets Funk, the crazy director of Mountain of Destiny. <laughs> I am a you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh God. Uh, I listen. I'm going to say it right now. Lenny Riefenstahl is my most problematic wood. <laughs> <laughs> I started right. to have it's, it's difficult not to kind of like cr like crush on her a little bit like when you're reading Dude, about her she's I, extraordinary. I looked, yeah, I looked up and the uh, I looked the up uh, the Holy Mountain the Wikipedia page and the cover is very evocative. I mean, it's basically mm -hmm. just her, but man, whew. Yep, yep, yep. She was she was putting it in. She, mm -hmm. I mean, and she had talent too. She was right. not. Yeah, yeah, she's not eye candy, just eye candy by any means. No. It's almost not fair that somebody who's that attractive is also that multi-talented. Hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, yeah. Really, uh, it, it's it's a shame that history kind of history history is looming around the corner for Lenny. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see. She persuaded him to feature her in one of his films. And this is where the Wikipedia gets it wrong, right? It's a reef install later received a package from Funk containing the script. It's like, well, no, he literally brought it to her while she was laid up in the hospital. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, she made a series of films for Funk where she learned from him acting and film editing techniques. And there's a little story here that I'm not going to read where they did a screen test and it came out really, really poorly. Like she ah. was mortified at how she looked. And then I think it might have been, it was Funk 
or someone else who was like, no, 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 we'll just we'll just light you differently. Mm-hmm. And they lighted her differently, and she she Looked was great. like, whoa. That, and she said that's where she learned the importance of lighting in film. Yeah. I don't yeah. think most normies have any clue that. Oh, the things is, you can do with lighting and with like focal length and some other things are incredible. Yeah. It's remarkable. Like mm-hmm. film is just pretty much the capturing of light. Mm-hmm. Like that's what cinematography. I mean, mm-hmm. there's more to mm-hmm. it, of course. Sure. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, one of Fonk's films that brought Reef and Stull into the limelight was The White Hell of Pitts Palou, 1929, co-directed by G.W. Pabst. Her fame spread to ca- countries outside Germany. Reef and Stull produced and directed her own work called Das Blaue Licht, The Blue Light, in 1932, co-written by Karl Mayer and Bella Blatz. The Blue Light is... Uh, fascinating. Oh, and on the After Dark, when I when I talk about the witch, uh, who the mountain witch who saves Lenny's uh, film career, mm. it's back when they were doing the mountain movies. So okay. if you want to hear that story, patreon.com slash art of dark pod. Yeah, the, the blue light is worth seeing. And uh, this is like her feature debut. It's 86 minutes long. It has the the look and feel of a mountain movie. Lenny plays the star, directs herself, and plays the star. She plays a witch, Junta, mm-hmm. uh, or a woman that they think is a witch. And, and here's the plot. The Blue Light is a frame story. So it starts with a modern couple. They arrive at a convertible automobile at an inn uh, in Santa Maria, a mountain village. Upon seeing an intriguing cameo-style photo of a woman, woman, they ask the innkeeper who she is. The innkeeper tells the young boy to bring in the book that contains Yunta's story. And the movie unfolds Mm -hmm. as the innkeeper opens a very large book to its title page. Yunta, played by Riefenstahl, is a young woman who lives at the turn of the century apart from her fellow villagers. Due to her feral strangeness, she is considered to be a witch. Mm -hmm. When she comes to town for one reason or another, the townsfolk chase her away. They feel that she must be in some way responsible for the ongoing deaths of the young men of the village. I mean, this in is, real life, the men were killing themselves constantly or trying to. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. You could see where it's a very thinly veiled metaphor. Yeah. yeah. This is because Junta is able to climb the local mountain unscathed while these young men continue to fall to their deaths, attempting to climb it under supernatural circumstances. And I could go on and read more, uh, but it was a moderate commercial and critical success. Performed well in Europe and the UK. Some critics were divided. Partic- yeah, go ahead, Brett. It's just a very. It's an interesting story. I mean, it, it's not mm. just boilerplate. That's a kind of a crazy premise. I like it. Yeah, and it's it's beautiful. It's it's beautifully yeah. shot. Lenny's beautiful, mm-hmm. and but in Germany, the the critics were kind of divided. Mm-hmm. The left wing publications derided the effort the right wing applauded it mm. ah this is a a stellar example of german womanhood you right. know and right. and the she's climbing the mountains the mountain is the the self here we have the ubermensch you know the mm. uberfrau you know mm. uh and all of that um and the left wing news publications were they're largely jewish a lot of jewish critics so mm. there's some there was some tension here like hmm. I, I'm not going to track Lenny's every single interaction with like uh, J- Jewish people or, right. or her assessment of the Jewish people because it would be it would take a scholar to really get that properly correct. Mm-hmm. But it is discussed that like this was a moment where she was like she noticed like ah oh, these leftists you know and a lot mm-hmm. of these leftists happen to be Jewish like what's going mm-hmm. on you know she that that kind of stung her a little bit at this point but it got mm-hmm. some pretty great reviews and. Mm-hmm. The film's aesthetic, uh, particularly the depiction of nature, is also said to have caught the attention of Adolf Hitler. Oh. 